next and um, this is the morning session. Um, just a few items of business before we start. Um, I think everybody is familiar with the emergency procedure, but basically if you hear um, the fire alarm, then please exit quietly and calmly, but um, out to the, um, the way out there onto the balcony and then down the stairs. And the assembly um, point is in Abbey Gardens. Um, there are a few rules about um, COVID. We're um, requesting entry to the room. Please uh, use available hand sanitizer um, and social distancing and wearing um, if you're walking around the room. Um, and the meeting rooms are cleaned before and after use. So members of the public, all your points are clean after um, the members of the public have been there. And we have to uh, leave the door open. Sorry for those who are sitting in front of it. And um, if you're feeling unwell, please speak to the meeting organiser which will be Esther, who's sitting outside. So we move on then to the items of business. Um, a reminder that um, this um, meeting is being recorded and it is live streamed from the um, City Council's website. It is also being videoed, which will be put up on the Council's YouTube um, shortly after the meeting where it will remain. Um, members of the public and members, but they probably know, please make sure that your mobile phones are turned off. Um, and um, I think that's all that I need to say as preamble. And so we move on then to the agenda. Um, first of all, we need to vote in a vice chair, um, and I would like to propose uh, Councillor Laming. Do we have a second? I would vote? second that, as he's already in situ. Yes, and he is in situ, and there is a reason for that, because were he to be sitting in a body of the meeting, as would be normal, we would then have to clean down his point where he'd been sitting and it would delay the meeting. So, so all those in favour of Councillor Laming to be Vice Chair for this meeting. So thank you. Welcome Councillor Laming. Um, right, apologies and deputy members. I think we have one apology. Councillor Rutter. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Councillor Rutter, and um, he's been replaced by Councillor Brock this morning. Yes, yeah. welcome, Councillor Brock. Um, disclosures of interests. Councillor Edward. Thank you, Chair. I wish to declare a person interested in the party item 12 and within a couple of hundred metres of the applicant's property and as a member. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as, as a board member of Labour, I, I have yeah. arranged several projectors. If you could remember to put your microphone on in future. Well, it, ah, it is now yeah. working. Thank you. So we, uh, but we, we heard all that. Thank you. Um, However, um, Chair, sorry. Um, although I don't judge this to be prejudicial, I do propose to withdraw for the item for the avoidance of any doubt. Okay. And Councillor Westwood? Thank you, Chair. Yes, item 13, Ashburton Place. I have met with the objectors for this particular item and I have a determined view on this particular item. So I'm going to step away from the committee and sit with the public. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members, any other declarations of interest? No, thank you. Um, minutes of the previous meeting, which are pages 9 to 16. Well, there's an accurate record of what happened at the meeting. Thank you. Um, and then we have an update sheet in front of us. 
Could we accept that as an addendum to the report? Thank you. So we move on then to the first planning item, which um, was the subject of us. We have it has already been committed, but we had a site visit um, on Monday, and everybody in the room um, on the committee was present at the site visit. Um, and that is Jasper's for Farley Close, Oliver's Battery. Um, and the report, sorry, I haven't got the number in front of me. The um, report is 21 stroke 00674 stroke HOU and it's proposed two and um, single story side extensions. Um, the case officer is Cameron Taylor, and when you're ready, Cameron, we're ready to hear your presentation. So thank you, Chair. The presentation is for a proposed two-story and single-story extension at Four Farley Close, following the, the committee site visit. Here is the location and site plan, where the location being situated to the southwest of Farley Close, and the site plan demonstrating the footprint of the proposal. The proposed extensions will retain a 1.7 metre minimum distance to the northern boundary, a 14.5 metre to the western boundary from the two storey element, and 4.7 metres to the southern boundary. Within the area, there have been developments such as single storey extensions and door windows, with two previous refusals within Farley Close being at number one and number five with number one being for a side story, a single story side extension and dormer windows, but that was refused due to unacceptable levels of overlooking to the neighbouring property. Number five also came forward for a loft conversion, which included a box dormer, which was refused by the virtue of its design, scale, size and form, along with having unacceptable overlooking impacts on the neighbouring property. Here we have an aerial photograph with a site marked by the yellow triangle, which shows the residential nature of the area. Followed by the north elevational drawing with the existing being the top and the proposed being the bottom. It shows the sort of the, the roof scape proposed extension with a cat side roof, with a two story extension width being about 6.6 .6 metres, with the total width of the ground floor elements, including the pitch to flat roof being 11.6 with an increase in the roof height over the existing dwelling to the peak of the two-story extension being 0.69 metres. Here we have the photo looking towards the north elevation of the property from just in front of the access to the drive. Followed by a photo set further back from the centre of the street looking towards the front elevation of the property. Here we have these south elevation drawings in which we can see be retaining the glazing to the existing dwellings along with a topographical change as it drops from the east to the west towards the flat map extension over here on the left hand side of the page. Whilst the width of the two-story extension itself from this elevation is only 4.2 meters <laughs> as well as including a high level apex window at the first floor level. Here we have a photo looking towards the rear elevation of the property. Followed by another view across the rear elevation looking towards the west. Next we have east elevation drawings. In which we can see the length of the proposed two-story extension itself will be about 12 metres, which then drops down to the pitch single storey element which is an additional three metres and retaining a 1.7 metre gap to the boundary. And as you can see, the increase in the height from this ridge here to the two storey is 0.69 of a metre. Here we have a photo looking towards the east elevation of the property. Followed by the west elevation of drawings. With the two storey extension having a max height from the ground level from this west elevation of drawing of about 6.4 metres, whilst the pitch, pitch single storey element has a max height of 5.2 metres from the ground level here, and the flat roof extension has a width of 6.7 metres across 
and the maximum height of 3.5 metres up until the maximum point excluding the land term. The external appearance of the proposal itself will include face and brick and roof tiles to match the existing dwelling with the windows and flat roof of the extension itself to be grey. Here we have the west elevational photos of the property, which we see the existing conservatory flat roof element to be replaced, followed by a wide angle shot showing the same elevation. Here have the existing ground floor proposed, existing proposed ground floor plans, which there, there is a level change on the site. However, internally, the floor level on the ground floor will remain the same across the entirety of the property. With the site with the um, topography changing and being sort of towards the southwest corner of the property being at the lowest and increasing further towards the public ground to the northeast. Next, we have proposed first floor drawings in which we see the additional two bedrooms and bathroom with no windows to the north elevation, which is along this wall here on the first floor level, and the window to the south elevation is a high level apex window and therefore does not provide views out whilst the additional windows along the west elevator itself look onto the site's garden. Next is the existing and proposed roof plan, which we see the interaction between the existing bungalow itself and proposed extension. Followed by a view looking towards the northern boundary, which will have confirmation from the applicant of the intention to retain the planting if possible. However, if it needs to be removed during the construction, then their intention is to replace it with additional planting for screening. Here we have a look towards the western boundary of the property itself. Followed by a view looking towards the southern boundary of the property, in which the extension will not project further for not project further towards the south elevation than the existing elevation of the dwelling itself. And here we have a view looking towards the south elevation of the property. This is from the back of Shepherd's Close, just to the access to number seven, I believe, in which we can see the roofscape of the existing dwelling. So, therefore, the conclusion is considered to accord with the policy of the local plan and the aims of the village of the Polish Battery Village Design Statement, and therefore the officer's recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, we now move to public speaking. Um, could I just remind public speakers that you have three minutes, and after three minutes, um, there will be an indication to you. Is there a clock somewhere? On the screen, Chair. I've just it's put it on the screen, screen now, just as an example. It's gone posh. And um, when your three minutes are up, I will ask you just to make a, a, a closing statement, final statement, but then you must stop, please. Um, and uh, yeah, so the first person will be Mrs. Celia Palmer, an objector. Good morning, Mrs. Palmer. Good morning. So when you're ready, okay. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of the nine local objectors. Number five did not object as he was seeking permission to raise his drive almost a metre and rebuild a double garage next to his house. You will all have seen the objectors' letters and their previous statements listing areas where this application contravenes multiple points in the Winchester District Local Plan, the specific extension, section on extensions, the Oliver's Battery Design Statement and the NPPF. You will also have seen from sketch representations and the site visit how adversely this extension would affect Farley Close and the surrounding area. Please remember that the two previous applications for significantly smaller loft conversions at number one and Farley Close were rejected for being contrary to numerous planning policies. The case officer report still contains many inconsistencies. He has now considered um, but not uh, the extension's height, bulk or impact of the neighbouring property. He has not taken into account the individual character of Barley Close. The two-storey extension has not been designed to work with the slope. There are no internal steps. And in fact, the design raises the floor level and consequently the roof level. And finally, the ridge height appears to be incorrect 
meaning it will be almost twice the 0.69 metres stated. For these reasons, we still conclude that the case officer's recommendation is based on misleading drawings and incorrect assumptions. Mrs. Dade states that her application has been carefully thought out, but with scant regard for anyone else in the close and surrounding area. It could easily have been more sympathetically designed by keeping the bungalow as a bungalow and extending further south and west into her rear garden. In summary, therefore, we would urge you to reject this application for this massive extension because it would set an enormous precedent for both Farley Close and Shepherd's Close. It would be totally out of keeping and out of proportion and scale to the existing bungalows in the close. It would have a ridge that is significantly higher than the existing bungalow, higher than the chimney stack. It would have elevations of unappealing blank walls and dominate number three's patio. And finally, it disregards the general principles dealing with extensions. It is not subservient to the existing bungalow. It more than doubles the bungalow's existing floor plan and it will dominate the street scene and overshadow immediate bungalows in the area. We hope and trust the committee will ensure planning policies prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there might be, um, Mrs. Palmer, some questions of clarification um, from members of the committee. Are there any? No. So thank you very much, Mrs. Palmer, for coming along today. Um, the next person is the Parish Council representative, Councillor Michener. Good morning, Councillor Michener. When you're ready, um, you have three minutes. OK, thank you very much. This proposal seeks to extend the property by a very significant second storey extension, which would create an overbearing bulk that would be out of character with the surrounding properties in Parley Close. It would also block the existing long views between number four and number three outwards beyond Oliver's Battery. The Oliver's Battery Village Design Statement seeks to protect outward views from the parish, and the 2018 parish plan reported that this was rated by 69% of households as the most positive aspect of living in Oliver's Battery. In 2014, there was a planning application by Five Farley Close for a loft conversion with Dora to rear and associated fenestration. The height of the proposed lock conversion of this application was no higher than the existing ridge and therefore lower and considerably less bulky than the two-storey extension now proposed by Farley Close. This application was rejected in the case officer's words as is a design, scale, size and form that would be out of keeping with the existing property, thereby dominating it and having an adverse impact on the wider area to the detriment of the visual amenities and character of Farley Close and Shepherd's Close. The proposed development is therefore contrary to policy DP3 of the Winchester District Local Plan, the Oliver's Battery Village Design Statement and the NPPF. The rejection of five Farley Close's application should be a significant consideration in the resolution of the current application for four Farley Close. The Parish Council takes issue with a number of statements in the Council, council Officers Case Officers Report. In particular, the two-storey extension has not been designed to work with the slope and ground levels. The floor level has been raised contrary to the slope of the ground, raising the roof level. The extension is clearly two-storey with windows to the second floor visible from all elevations. The reports claim that the proposal will not cause any significant adverse harm to the character and appearance of the surrounding area. Area is refuted. And the report states that the increase in ridge height of the two-storey extension is by a marginal amount. It is argued that any increase in height must be considered in the context of the closest existing environment and that, that it is out of scale and overbearing. This application should not be compared with other locations within Oliver's Battery, as the context is completely different. In summary, the ridge height of the 2014 application for the neighbouring property, which was rejected, was no higher than the existing ridge, therefore lower and less bulky than this application, which raises the ridge level. Consequently, this application must also be contrary to policy DP3 of the local plan and the MPPF, as well as the Oliver's Battery Village Design Statement, and therefore should be rejected. If approved, this application would create an undesirable and unwanted precedent, which would be detrimental to Farley Close's character and amenity. If the committee is minded to approve the application, 
the parish council would want to understand how planning policy has changed since the 2014 application was rejected. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Right, we now turn to ward councillors. Um, we have uh, uh, yeah. oh, so sorry. Thank you. Um, any questions that Councillor Mitchell? Thank you, Councillor. Okay. So, um, we now turn to the ward councillors. We have Councillor John Warwick here, who's going to speak on her own behalf. And then she's going to read um, a statement from another Lord Councillor, Councillor Anna Williams, who is self isolating and really today can't be here in person. So you have three minutes for yourself and three minutes for. Oh, sorry. I have to say, I've just returned from a very long COVID absence and it's sort of slightly befuddled my brain. Um, so you have three minutes for yourself and three minutes for council. So five minutes. There, there we go. Five minutes for yourself, third time lucky, and five minutes for Councillor William. And when you're ready, we're Thank ready you. to. Finish. Thank you so much, Chairman. Can I just say um, how much we appreciate both ward councillors that the committee took the time to visit the site. That was really important to us. So thank you everybody for doing that. Um, Chairman, I'm going to read my statement first and then, then switch to Councillor Williams. Um, as you heard, we have the parish chairman of Oliver's Battery here today. And Oliver's Battery is very fortunate to be served by a particularly efficient and effective parish council who are proactively engaged closely in the planning process with Winchester City Council. They produced their own very neat village design statement back in 2008 um, and more recently um, an extensive parish plan in 2018 with a range of strong supportive policies designed to provide a range of accommodation and to preserve that accommodation to suit their residents from younger residents and families to our older residents from single accommodation right up to family homes. The settlement pattern, as you saw in your visit in Oliver's Battery, was developed in the late sort of 1960s and 70s with a central core of two-storey houses with surrounding areas of single-storey, low-density bungalows with open plan gardens. This creates an uncrowded, low-rise, balanced aspect and is perfectly characterised, if you like, in Farley Close, which is a particularly narrow road consisting of seven single-storey bungalows with occupancy of between one to three residents. And you saw this on your site visit. The Oliver's Battery Village Design Statement acknowledges that as properties change hands, there will be a desire to convert single storey properties into much larger two storey homes. However, this has generally been resisted by planning decisions to date. Indeed, in 2015, an extension at number five, as you heard, was refused by virtue of its design, its size, its scale, and from having an, a detrimental effect on the character of Farley Close, summarised by policy DP3. Plans before you propose a 160% increase in the footprint by creating a five bedroom house from a three bedroom bungalow with, as you heard, the 0.69 metre increase in the ridge height. The consequent increase in bulk will significantly impact the immediate neighbour at number three, as well as the overall low level character of the close. Indeed, if this is built out as planned, every other property will be subservient to number four, Farley Close. As the parish chairman confirmed, the proposals are contrary to the Oliver's Battery Village Design Statement guidelines. But importantly for us today, the size and scale of these proposals could also be considered contrary to national and our own Winchester City Council planning policies in three ways. Firstly, if we look to the National Planning Policy Framework, paragraph 127C, highlights the importance of density and layout in relation to neighbouring buildings 
and the local area generally. I would therefore challenge the officer's conclusion in this case that this proposal fits well with the surrounding context. The extended dwelling will dominate the neighbouring properties, create additional traffic movements, will be at odds in the narrow close, unbalancing the present orderly layout of small, low-rise dwellings with large gardens. Secondly, our own Winchester local plan, policy CP13, outlines how any development should respond to the local context, which is why many communities have taken the time to produce village design statements. This establishes local standards, standards which are pertinent to the local area. New development should connect seamlessly to surrounding developments in terms of layout and scale and space. The individual design in this case may be of high quality and I don't deny that. However, the scale is very much at odds with its neighbours and therefore at odds with local plan policy CP13. Finally, our planning policy DM15 from local plan part two draws attention to distinctiveness and requires us to give regard to the cumulative effect of each development on the character of the area. So a single overdeveloped plot such as this will ruin the distinctive character of this area and is contrary to our policy DM15. This is particularly relevant in Oliver's Battery in general and to Farley Close in particular. Councillor Warwick, you've had your five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. So I've just finished that. On to Councillor Williams, the five minutes. Thank you. Um, and so Councillor Williams' statement, she has um, several objections. Firstly, the size of the close and the impact on parking. So Farley Close, as you saw, is one of the smaller closes in Oliver's Battery, with limited off-street parking, meaning that smaller driveways associated with the houses are in keeping with the current bungalow type of housing. A large dwelling like this will increase the need for cars and set a potential precedent for other properties to extend in the same way. This would create a real parking issue in the close as it's not already easy to parking and it's not safe to do so on Old Kennels Lane. There have been previous rejections on this site, firstly at number five, Farley Close, and this property was rejected for a number of reasons by virtue of its design, scale, size and form and would be out of keeping with the existing properties, therefore dominating, having an adverse impact on the wider area to the detriment of the visual amenities and character Farley Close and the nearby Shepherd's Close. It is contrary to policy DP3 of the local plan. At number one Farley Close, this property's application was rejected because of the unacceptable level of overlooking the private space of the neighbouring property and was contrary also to policy DP3 of the local plan. If these much smaller, less imposing extensions were rejected for similar reasons, it seems counterintuitive to allow this significantly larger extension. And as you have seen, the proposed extension will be built right up against the neighbour's boundary, making it almost impossible to hide the invasiveness of this build. Councillor Williams has concerns about the size. The plans show the intended property will be a 160% increase. This will dramatically change the appearance and the character of the close, making it more cluttered and overdeveloped. And overdeveloped. From the original plans originally shown to residents, the plans showed two kitchens. The current plan, however, shows, shows a large um, utility room and a smaller kitchen. There are therefore concerns that this property could easily become annexed at a later date into two separate dwellings. Although the current owners may have no such plans by allowing such a development, we are opening up the possibility of this and therefore putting even more strain on the closest infrastructure and parking, as well as overcrowding. And finally, an important point around the housing stock. All of this battery is unique in the ward as, we, as it has many small bungalows set in good sized gardens. These properties serve an important purpose in the district's housing stock. As a community with different age groups and housing needs, we need to ensure there is enough of the right type of housing for all stages of life and for all members of our community. 
The continued erosion of this key housing type has a detrimental impact on our housing stock. Winchester has an ageing population and high property costs. If bungalows are continually extended, they become large family homes, and this means they cannot serve the purpose for which they were intended. Therefore, if we allow this bungalow to be extended, we open the door for further development of this type. These have already been two rejected proposals in this close for smaller extensions. Therefore, we need to look at the benefits to our community allowing these key properties to, to be depleted from our housing stock. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I didn't want to interrupt Councillor Warwick when she was on a roll, but it wouldn't be fair to ask her about Councillor Williams' statements. But are there any questions on um, Councillor Warwick's own statement? Councillor Brong. You made reference to the fact that um, the houses in the close are, um, I think, um, don't have first um, first floors, and you know, they're all ground floor. But when during the site visit, I observed dormer windows to uh, one of the well, one of the homes um, to the north. So, can you clarify for me whether there are um, houses that have a first floor within the close? Thank you, Councillor Bonk. I'm not sure if that is, is, is a development into the roof space or if there is an additional floor on that property, but I do know it received retrospective planning permission, so that was built without original planning permission and had to seek retrospective. Thank you. Right, so then we move on to our final speaker, who's a supporter, Janet Dade. Firstly, thank you to the committee for taking the time to visit the site so that perspective and context can be given to this application. In Farley Clares, there are already two chalet bungalows. Both have upstairs bedrooms and large ground floor extensions. The planning application refused at number five was for a large dormer directly overlooking properties in Shepherd's Close. We carefully avoided this design and aspect. Three properties in the close are now occupied by working age families. Indeed, the spokeswoman for the objectors, Mrs Palmer, rents to a very nice family of four. This area is not exclusively occupied by the elderly. These are family homes. With reference to Oliver's battery design statement, on page 18 it clearly states, conversion of bungalows around the periphery of Oliver's battery should normally be resisted. Barley Close is not on the periphery. Conversely, within the central core, the conversion of bungalows to two-storey dwellings should be permitted, provided it is sensitive to the character of its immediate location. Successful conversions will provide both a distinctive and internally consistent style to the resulting dwelling. There is no prohibition on a minimal increase in ridge height, and we've opted for the lowest internal ceiling height now recommended by building regulations. Our brief to our designer was simple. One, don't design something radical which doesn't suit the road. Two, don't interfere with our neighbours' privacy. Three, incorporate solar and heat pump technology and be eco-efficient. Four, protect the beautiful walnut tree. Five, design a home for young and old, for working at home and for family life. The planning officer appointed by the council has approved the design in full. Presumably, his recommendation is also overseen by his professional colleagues. Change and modernisation are often met with resistance and should always be sensitive and careful. And this has been our approach in updating this small 1950s bungalow. To suggest that our application is either aggressive redevelopment or a dangerous and unwanted precedent is simply unjustifiable. On the contrary, the new building will be more attractive, much more eco-friendly and will improve the street scene. We live in a time of housing shortage, particularly for the young and a climate crisis which cannot be ignored. We all know that commercial developers are interested in Oliver's battery. Big change may lie ahead, but ours is a genuine application to create a sustainable family home for the long term. It represents no threat to anyone and offers a way forward for multi-generational living. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Dade. And I, I believe you're the applicant. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, any questions for Mrs. Dade? No, thank you very much for coming along today. Um, Cameron, anything you want to pick up uh, that you've heard in the public speaker? No, Chair. Um, 
there are two recurring um, sort of issues. One is the refusals for numbers one and five previous applications. <gasps> And I know you referred to that in your report. Could you just remind us again? Sorry, you put your so yeah. the application number one was for a side story, a single story side extension along with rear dormers to create first floor accommodation. And this was reviewed solely due to the unacceptable level of overlooking over the private amenity area to the neighbouring property. And number five, which is for a conversion of the loft with a, a box dormer to the rear. That was refused as say I'll read out the first sort of reason for refusal. So the first is the proposed roof extension by virtue of its design, scale, size, and form would be out of keeping with the existing property, thereby dominating it and having an adverse impact on the wider area, the detriment of the visual amenities and character of Farley Close and Shepherd's Close. The proposed development is therefore contrary to policy DP3, the Winchester District Local Plan, the Oldest Factory Village Design Saving and the MPPF. And the second reason for refusal was for the proposed roof extension is contrary to policy DP3 of the Winchester District Local Plan Review that it would directly over the neighbouring properties to the detriment of material harm of their private amenities. Thank you. We've every application that's been And the other result we're referring to was the ridge one. Um, you see in our update that we've the microphone. Yes. I see that the ridge height was in the, the other recurring um, issue. I think that in the update sheet, we have um, had confirmation from the agent that the plans provided for the application are scaled accurately. And does that include the ridge height? That's correct. That does include the ridge height. OK, thank you. Let's move then, members, to um, the report. Um, I've already explained that I feel I'm only operating at 80% today, but I'm getting better. Um, and I forgot to introduce the officers. So to my left is Judy Pinnock, who's the service lead for the built environment. Then we have Catherine Knight, who's got a very grand title, but today she's our legal advisor. And then we have um, Matthew Watson, um, who is um, our sort of clerk to the committee. Um, and then members all have their names in front of them. So let's look at page 19 and 20, the principle of development and the design and layout. Yeah. Good morning. Um, could you explain then why it's acceptable to change the group level? Um, when you can turn it down consistently in that class as well as Shepherd's class. Can you speak into the microphone? Uh, Sorry, Vice Chair. Could you move the. Um, yeah. Usually, if you refer to me, making too much noise. Um, we have a difference in roof height on this where we actually um, rejected that in previous occasions. So, why are we uh, allowing this to be an increase in the roof height? And this particular one, which alters the character of the neighborhood. Like to explain that, please. So yeah, the ones which have been refused were were refused in regards to yeah. the sort of size and scale of the dormer itself, which is number five is for a large box dormer, which as they would be viewed in the council, sort of against high quality place SPD is not being a favourable sort of extension to a roof scope, whilst the proposed is for an extension itself and thus not a not a dormer window and, and sort of assessed against differently in regards to its size and scale. And so each application is assessed against its own merit with regards to that. And sort of given the, the unique location of the property in the southwestern corner with the garden itself projecting further to the west with the extension situated there, it is considered that the, the, the increase of 0.69 of a meter is not considered to um, be detrimental to the uh, character of the area as a result of it, despite, as it, despite the, the rise as the existing bungalow does retain its existing Roof height itself, and it's just the extension which is being raised. Thank you. But, uh, also, we've got conflict. We would hear from the parish council on the British design statement, so I'd like that clarified if I may. Within the British design statement, it makes reference to sort of the, the protection of sort of the views out of the property. However, Farley Close does not have a marked view as shown on map on map number three. 
and nor is it within the views viewpoints of any of those locations shown on the map within the village design statement. Um, and then within the area in which it's sort of situated under the old Kendall old Lane under SK2, they, it's not the causing the addition of an additional dwelling within the boundary of the property. And they say given location of the site with the topography in the area is considered to not dominate the street scene and thus why the increase, what well, is an increase to the, uh, the height of the dwelling itself, that isn't considered to be detrimental. I, I was going to mention the village design statement itself, but you've answered the question. But I think it's useful um, that um, if there is a village design statement, that reference is made, as you've just done, um, in the report, so that um, the Irish Council and whoever is reading it knows that that has been taken into account. Any more questions on design and layout? That's the worst one. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies, but I'm going to return to the reach height question. Um, I understand that the agent has said the plans are accurate and so on. But Cameron, can I just refer you to pages 28 and 29 in our pack? Conveniently, one before the other. Okay. And on page 28, there is a schematic of the build which clearly shows the rich height field above the chimney level of the new build. When I look at the photograph below, um, I find it hard to believe that that rich height is, is only 0.69. I would question that rich height measurement. Um, purely from the view, I clearly have not measured it, not from the roof, I, but I have done the site visit. But for me, that seems inconsistent, um, which several people have pointed out already. I just wonder whether there's uh, any clarification we can get to confirm as the actual increase in reach height and not above the chimney level. Thank you. As I say, following sort of the additional sort of correspondence in regards to the querying of said reach height, that was when I did contact the agent to get confirmation, which he confirmed the increase from the existing to the two-star extension was as measured on said plans. So that is so that is the height in which we apply have been sort of referring to as that has been told to me is, is accurate. I think the concern of not wanting to put words into Council Westwood's um, speech, but the concern was that the ridge height goes above the chimney level. And if it does, is that a bad thing? So from my assessment of it, it was it was assessed to not sort of be detrimental to the impact should said ridge height go above the chimney itself. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just want to draw the attention to this page when we're given at the site. There's an advantage to this particular thing as the, older than the one we've been given in the pack. It actually shows by dotted line uh, the difference to the existing house and the new thing. So you can see where it is, particularly in this lower drawing. So you can see where the chimney is uh, and the fact that it, this is a capsule roof. So my question though, I mean, that's point of information, all the members of the site could probably confirm it. Yes. Um, 0.69 metres, but two foot six. Uh, slightly look smaller than the height of this table actually. Um, if this extension had covered the whole of this ridge, in other words it wasn't a cap roof, would your opinion have been then to refuse this application and therefore effectively the, your recommendation is based on the fact that it is a, um, a cap roof, in other words the height gets lower as you go to the neighbourhood. Am I correct in thinking that? Yeah, Councillor Pearson, that's not the application we're considering today. We're considering what's in front of us. Yeah. I know, but we are considering the application that's in front of us, not what might have been the answer had there been a different scenario. Well, I'm, I'm referring to page 20, like uh, uh, impact on current of the area. So is that a viable question or not? 
Do, do you want to answer that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think, as you say, we have to consider this one on its merits and, and not what it might have been had the roof form been different. But I think Councillor Pierce is right. It's we're recommending an approval on the basis of the application in front of us based on the built form and the roof form. OK, I will refer back to that when I do the debate. Then. Uh, <clears throat> if it's, that question is not viable, even though it is actually about something that the officer has written, fair enough. Well, we seem to move on to impact on the track of the area. Let's do both impact. Impact. No, no, no. Question from Councillor Reed. I have one, please. Um, Chairman, it's on, on design. Yes. Um, I asked the question at the site meeting with regard to the B up windows. When you look at the plans, you will note that 50% of one side of the roof is actually glass. You see, Joe? relax windows and my concern is the light spillage. I know we're not in a dark area, however, um, this council is supposed to be uh, environmentally friendly um, and whether any shields are to be placed on these fittings in order to conform with what we think is council policy. Um. Mm -hmm. Chairman Yard picked that up. Thank you. Yes, as, as Councillor Reeves said, we don't have, we're not part of the National Park and we're quite a significant distance away at this location. We don't have uh, any dark sky reserve or any policies on that. So I think what we would have to do in terms of looking at this application is think about its context and its relationship to the wider area. I, I had a good drive around after our visit uh, on um, earlier in the week. And actually, there's quite a lot of roof form with, with roof lights. And I really don't think in the context of the wider area, you could argue this would cause light spill intrusion that would be harmful to that part of Oliver's battery chair. So I really don't think that would be reasonable in my view. And we certainly could sustain a reason for refusal on that basis. Thank you, Chair. I'm just drawing attention. In fact, 50% of the roof is now light. Okay. Um, impact on the area and impact on neighbouring There is one question I, I raised of Cameron at the site visit, and that is exactly how close is this um, extension to the neighbouring house, which I think what, is number five. I think we we're talking about was it, Cameron? It's number three in which the extension yeah, project okay. was about. That one. So could, could you? Uh, I know you threw a lot, a lot of um, numbers out of it earlier on, but I, I, I missed them in my haste to catch one of them. The significant one to me is the extension uh, where it comes down to the cat roof down to the flat roof extension. How far is that edge of that building from the actual building of the neighbour? Actually, um, I don't have the exact measurements to, to the neighbour itself, but it is 1.7 metres to the boundary from the, the closest point right, of the so, extension itself. So if I, I mean, if you walk down that ginnel, which is about my shoulder width, I think, uh, my shoulder's scraping against the wall on one side and the fence on the other. Um, so I presume that is about a metre there with the 1.5 metres, so we're talking about something like 2.5 metres, would, would I be exaggerating that? About 2.7 to sort of 3 metres yeah. okay. to sort of consider the property. Okay, I mean, that, that was a question I asked about the other side, yeah. because I'm happy with that, I just wanted to emphasise that. Absolutely. Thank you. Can we uh, consider putting in a clause into the uh, recommendation that says that it should be... Uh, Sorry. Uh, can we consider uh, retaining the hedge between the two properties as a condition? I, during my conversation with the applicant, I believe she said she'll be happy for condition as the, the intention was to retain or if the hedge had to be removed to add new planting into there to, to screen the extension itself. Once we got to landscape, I was going to propose the condition, but we can do it now. Um, we were concerned about the hedge, the retention of the hedge between um, this current property number four and number five, and in case it came down through building works, um, there is no condition currently 
to reinstate that um, boundary. So would the committee, if this is approved, um, be happy to have a landscape condition um, regarding that hedge? And I don't know how that sticks in. Yeah, does it fit in with that condition? Is that agreed? If, if... Chairman, I, I, I was going to ask a question with regard to this, but we weren't actually on the subject. Um, however, if that vegetation is retained, um, that will impede anybody who has to make a quick getaway down the side. In other words, it will block the exit off totally, and there will only be one exit from the property, which is at the other end. Um, would that be a wise thing to do? Come on. Yeah. Well, talk between the governor with the here, and um, they're wanting to retain the um, landscaping so that it doesn't intrude number five on junior. Um, yeah, Chair, I think just looking at the uh, floor plan, what you can see along that axis that between the two properties is that would be a blank elevation of um, ground floor, and it does show a, a, a side passageway door, doesn't it? It doesn't show the landscaping. I, I would suggest that um, it'd be quite difficult to say you must keep as much as possible in a, a planning condition because that'd be really tricky to manage and then you know who decides on how much is enough and what's possible so perhaps i would suggest if you were otherwise minded to approve this uh, wanting some sort of um security along that boundary we could ask for details of a planting scheme could we along that boundary and that may well include retention of some of the existing planting if that can be retained during construction you know it may well be that there's some cutting back uh, and protecting some that are immediately adjacent to the, the fencing there along the boundary. And then perhaps that may need to be reinforced uh, once work's complete. But if you were minded to approve, we could add a condition that, that asks for those very details and then we can be satisfied about those arrangements. And it can be then the right planting along the very sort of edge of the pathway that would take anyone you know, using this property, wishing to sort of go along that route to the back garden. I mean, there are other routes in, but that's the only one that's probably um, not an internal route chair. The rest is all um, right up to boundaries, isn't it? Sure, mm -hmm. I did note on the day the vegetation will take up 50% of the availability on the park. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the proposal seems quite a sensible one that, you know, details of a planting scheme um, if necessary, and then the officers can assess exactly what would be um, leaving a, a, a space to get out the passageway and also the screening between four and five um, so with your agreement if that's to be approved would that condition be uh, all right chairman are we talking about uh, house number three or house number five because neither well, we're talking about the book, the, the hedge between yeah, four I understand and five. Between three, three, four and four. five. Three. three and four. Three. The hedge we're talking about is four, and yeah. the, the, the hedge, hedge between three and four, aren't we? Nothing to do with five. Five's on the left hand side. I thought the one that we went in, the garden that we went in, was five. Was it not? Number three, my mistake. Thank you, Chair. Right, you, if we're going to build a wall up against number three boundary, how can you maintain a hedge in between? Well, that's why the condition would ask for detail. Chair, I don't think there's any intention to change the existing boundary treatment between the two properties. I think it's a fence along that boundary, isn't it? I'm looking at Cameron. Fence and hedging. So the fence would remain between the two yeah. properties, number four and number three. What we're suggesting is that within the application site of number four, where they've got very mature, quite deep vegetation along that Absolutely. edge, that that would be trimmed back. And if needed be, it's be reinforced with some further landscaping. Um, between the boundary and the re and the wall of the new um, extension is about 1.7 metres, so you need about 800 mil normally, don't you, for a footway. So there is room there for planting between 
this, the side elevation of the extension, the pathway, and then some boundary treatment up to the fence chair. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Let's go back to where we were. Um, I didn't realise that was going to take up so much time. And I have Councillor Westwood, who wants to ask a question on impact. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think many of the questions have just been uh, stolen by other members of the committee here. But I, I will point out, uh, Cameron, on impact of neighbouring properties, that those two storey extensions situated centrally within the site. Well, I don't believe it is centrally within the site, the building up to uh, close to the boundary on one side. My concern, Chair, was exactly what we've been talking about, which is maintaining some sort of screening between number three and number five with the build on that side. But I think medically we have it. I do want to think people are wrong again. Three and five three we're talking four, about. Three and four, three and four, three and four. Okay, oh right, thank you. Um, any more on the two impacts? No. So landscape and trees, I think we've done. Um, so anything else on the report, which includes highways and parking, which was mentioned by public speakers. And the conditions. Chairman, if I may, with regard to the highways, I note that there is no comment on highways themselves on this particular application. Um, considering the amount of room or lack of room there could be around the area. Um, it's a thing that we're always facing. I'm just wondering why highways weren't approached. So with such development being household, I say we given standing advice from Hampshire Council in regards to the highways as the proposal wasn't affecting the access and therefore we used standing advice and talk through that it was assessed to not cause uh, harm in regards to the passing of the highways through the development. Okay, Councillor Reid. Right, so um, there being no more questions, um, debate. Councillor Lamey. I'm afraid this uh, application does give me a great deal of concern as it goes, in my opinion, against the British design state. So can't can... me. I'm awfully sorry to keep asking you, yeah. but just can't. Yeah. I'm quite here. So either could you move it even further or. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this does give me a great deal of concern um, as it goes against the British design statement as such. As we've heard from the parish uh, chairman, uh, I also feel that because of the planning history of that area, changing the design of the roof for the extension is not really good, um, and it goes against some of our policies of DP3, CP13, as well as DM15. Um, so I don't think I could support this application. Okay, any more contributions to debate? Councillor Pearson. Uh, yes, Chairman. It's, it's an interesting one. When one looks at the, the comments you've made about this building should be the centre of the site, uh, look around the other buildings, you can't say that they're always in the centre of the site. Indeed, the original building is not even in the centre of the site. Um, so I think that comment is a bit of a non starter regarding putting an extension in. To me, the significant thing about this is first, where the ridge height, the high ridge height went right up to the end of the extension and therefore bring the massing much closer to, I think it's agreed, it's number three. I, would, I, I must admit my opinion, that would have meant that this would have been turned down automatically. But the fact that the applicant has, uh, or the architect has put in a capside roof, which actually has lowered the height of the roof closer to the neighbour, I think is very much in the applicant's favour and indeed opens up the possibility that we could be minded to approve this application. I'm a little bit nervous about 
um, how the landscaping modification you suggested, Chairman, is interpreted. Because uh, again, I'm looking at between number three and their um, fence, which they have there, when we went down that ginnel, there wasn't any planting there. The significant planting was once you got beyond the actual building. And there, I would say very much that planting in number three, sorry, number four, has to be preserved because it does help to screen this new section of, of this proposal. Um, and I was very much aware of that, not just on that boundary, but all the other boundaries. The planting that the applicant already has in the garden is quite significant. I, I know it is summer and many of those plants are deciduous, but nonetheless it's significant and does hide not only the existing building, but in my mind, what the proposal is as well. You might, from number three, be able to see part of the roof. And as I say, in old money, two foot six, let's just say the height of this table. Um, it would be very difficult to turn down that because when I moved into the roof of my house, we raised its actual fact about two feet. So I, I personally be a little bit perverse if I turn it down on that basis. And again, the comments about the dormer roofs, there were actually a number of dormer roofs in that fairly close and also in on Cranham Road, which were visible from the garden of number four. So to be against the dormer roofs on that basis, uh, I, I think again, would be very difficult to sustain. Uh, I'm, to me, it's, getting maximum use of the very limited space that they have. The cap roof saved, saves it. Uh, I don't see an increase in roof height of 2.6 being particularly relevant. If this was a second floor, it would be a great deal higher than that. In actual fact, it is one and a half floors. And I think we've got to bear that in mind. Uh, if it was two floors, then you'd be talking about, I think, another two meters. Right. And that would be to me, no, you can't do that. I would I would then argue for refusal. Uh, so based on that, uh, I am looking at the uh, decision that Cameron has, has made about the permit. Um, I can see where it's coming from. I've got to say the site visit was very helpful to me because when I looked at the raw plant, I, I thought, oh, crumbs, that doesn't look right. But actually getting into the site visit and seeing it in context, uh, I could I could understand why Cameron has made the decision here. So I'm happy with that. Okay, thank you. Any further contribution? Mm -hmm. Councillor Bell. <clears throat> I think this is totally overdevelopment of the site and I shan't be supporting it. Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you. Um, I totally agree with uh, your comment that we need uh, reference within the report itself to um, the uh, village design statement and uh, key elements of it. Um, I found it particularly helpful that the, um, the applicant made reference and a, a distinction to um, parts of the village design statement um, to help clarify why uh, she felt uh, it was consistent with the design statement um, and obviously had I had the opportunity having heard that to go back to the parish chair I might have you know, raised that question um, with, with him. Um, so the, uh, the list of um, planning policies makes reference to the design statement but I do feel uh, it's important for the actual text of the report to draw our attention to why the uh, planning officer was satisfied that the design statement had been taken into account and the requirements were met. I do agree with the need for the um, uh, condition, but I do think that uh, 1.7 metres is quite sufficient for a uh, reasonable um, uh, vegetation screen. Um, reference was made to precedent. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that we consider the merits of each plot. And um, because of the configuration of this one um, and the, um, the nature of the design, um, whilst it does have an impact on the view um, from the close uh, uh, out across the other properties, 
Um, I don't regard this as overbearing um, a massive in, in terms of the, the overall street scene or the neighbour. Um, and therefore, I shall be uh, supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Any further contributions? Sorry. Councillor Ray, do you want to? Thank you, Chairman. Noting what previous speakers have already said, I have noted the date of the village design statement. And one must always bear in mind that this should be always updated. We're now coming on to 2021 stroke two. Um, and I think there's a need to just revise it. Uh, and this is what I believe the City Council has been asked for parishes to do uh, at the same time. I've also noted the refusal of the other two applications in the vicinity when it came to dilemma windows. Um, I do still have a concern about half of the roof space being in a glass situation. Um, all you will get is spikes of light going up. And I would hope that the um, the applicant will take note of that and maybe put some shields on those particular windows. Um, we're looking at, as already stated, a, a 1950s style structure. Here we are 70 years on um, and families need to grow. Um, and I think this is a, I can't say modest, it is quite a, a large extension for the size of the property, but it is not totally out of keeping. When you look at the vegetation between three and four, um, if you're in number three, the view will be very little different because the roofscape will be stepped away from you. And like Councillor Pearson, if that roof line had come straight across and straight down, different kettle of fish altogether. But this is a, a roofscape that will be sloped away from the particular property of number three. Um, the vegetation, I like the idea and agree with the idea of putting um, a new uh, conditioning with regard to the vegetation there because I looked at the site visit and a good 50% of the proposed pathway between the two properties is going to be covered with this particular existing vegetation. So if there's an emergency and you have to get out of the building, out of grounds, that I think is the only way. Looking at the picture on page 30 of our reports, um, I can't see without climbing over the neighbour's property, any other way out from that particular property. So um, it's an emergency exit, if nothing else. Presumably bins would come out that way, I don't know. But I think I'm in agreement with the officer's recommendation. I cannot really find a planning reason to go against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Um, any further contribution? And uh, I agree with everything that Councillor Reid has just said. Um, I did actually visit the site um, ready for the last um, meeting, which I wasn't at. Um, and um, I've, you will see this extension, but I do think it has been done in quite a sympathetic manner. And um, if we just have the condition saying there should be details provided, common sense will then make sure that there are exits out and that the, you know, the screening could be retained as much as possible. Um, and the dormers, I don't have a problem with either, because then we looked down the bottom of the close and there were dormer windows down there. So um, I, I think every property has the right to um, expand, given they don't go against um, planning material planning reasons. And I um, can't see material planning reasons to refuse this. So I should be voting for approval. Are we at that stage? Are we at the vote? So this recommend this um, application has been recommended for approval with the addition of an extra condition, which will um, be put in by the case officer in consultation with me 
um, to the effect that the required details of planting, not necessarily between three and four, but for the boundaries to ensure that there is as much protection for the neighbours as possible. Um, so all those in favour of approving this application, please show. Seven, Chair. And those against? Two. So that application is approved. Right. We have to sort of clean down the work surfaces and whatever for the next application. So if anyone needs a quick comfort break, then please take the opportunity. <coughs> Thank you very much, members of the public, for coming in today.
pull back uh, and um, all the stations, members of the public, you can be assured that they've all been sanitised. Um, so um, we're moving on to item seven. Bob Stables Equestrian Centre, Durley Brook Road, Durley, um, obviously Southampton, Hampshire. The case number is 21-0910-OUT and the application is in our report and it's quite long so I won't read all of it but it's a hybrid application um, demolition of existing buildings, 23 custom built plots, um, parking facilities for the primary school and the church, upgrades to footpath, new crossing point for the school. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So um, the case officer is Rose Lisco, and she's here ready to give her presentation. So when you're ready, Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the update sheet uh, where I make reference to the new national model, national model design code that was ad adopted in July this year with the new MP MPBF. Um, I have not received an objection from the ecologist. Um, and just as a verbal update, there has been a slight change to the final page of this presentation. So here we have the red line plan. Fortunately, they've come through a little bit blurry today. Um, to the south of the site at the point of the cursor runs Dirty Brook Road. At the top, you can just see the edge of Church Lane here and Greenwood Lane runs here. Here we have an aerial view of the site with a better view of the surrounding roads. Durley Brook Road runs to the south with Church Lane to the west. The church is the point of the cursor to the northwest of the site and the school is at the point of the cursor to the southeast of the site. So I started with the detailed section of the application. So we have here the proposed layout of the site. You can see the proposed um, business community building here at the end of the, or opposite the entrance forming a end vista. The proposed parking for the park and stride is at the top here at the point of the cursor with three bays of 10 cars spaces each. The open space areas, there is a modest one in the centre of the site here and a larger one at the edge of the site here. Here we have the proposed elevations for the community or business building. The proposed materials would be red brick with a metal roof for the pitch section and a green roof for the flat roof section for the entranceway. And here we have the floor plan for the proposed business or community building. The entranceway is at the top here with toilet facilities and storage. The main part of the building is currently blank as there's no current end user in mind. Um, just for clarification, this would be for uses under the class E and F, um, which includes uses such as a gym, a shop, cafe, restaurant, office, research and development, or a public space, including schools. Here we have the proposed layout for some of the landscaping. The larger open space at the top of the site here has a couple of swales. There's one large kidney shaped one here and an elongated one just below it. 
the proposed footpath you can see just in brown at the point of the cursor, so it's a slight variation in its current route and to link it to the parking spaces as well as the rest of the wider development. The boundaries you can see for each of the plots, um, the orange would be closed boarded fencing and the blue would be post and rail fencing. There's a few more details for the footpath. Um, the red dotted line here is the proposed route with going up to the church to the northwest and down to the school in the southeast. Uh, there is proposed crossing where you can see here opposite the school and further down there is another crossing which I believe has been previously agreed with Hampshire Highways prior to this application being submitted. And there's a few details regarding the proposed crossing opposite the school. Unfortunately, this is also a bit there, so I'll explain as best I can. The blue dot, dotted line is the proposed route, which is roughly in line with where it is now for the footpath. The existing bus lay-by would be removed and replaced with a wider footpath and lay, the rest of it laid to grass. The footpath would also include um, level access curbs for buses. Um, there's some lighter blue dots either side of the road here, which would be the proposed pedestrian crossing with tactile paving. Um, you can see it's corner detail at the top here and on the side, this is where an existing hedge is for one of the um, adjacent dwellings and this would be trimmed back to ensure sight lines for the crossing. At the other end, this is the main entrance to the proposed development. Um, the crossing can be seen here in a slightly darker yellow square. This would be the proposed pedestrian crossing. They've slightly moved the entrance to the west for um, cars and vehicles to make sure that there is sufficient visibility displays for the crossing at this point. And then we move on to the outline part of the application. So again, we have the proposed layout. The blue hatch spaces are um, proposed plots that would be restricted to two or three beds in line with the policy CP2. Um, they are arranged around a central open space area here and the rest would address the road layout, which is considered to be acceptable. Here we have an example plot passport, which contains uh, the main restrictions and requirements for each plot. Um, so the hatched area here, this would be the maximum amount of building area allowed for this particular plot. This would include any um, garages if they chose to have one. To the rear, they have bin and cycle storage. A larger square here shows um, an optional outbuilding that can be um, used for ancillary uses or incidental uses, such as an office or an annex. On the other side here, um, it shows where on the site the plot would be. It also shows principal elevations. In this case, this is a corner plot, so there would be two. It shows where the main access to the plot would be, as well as other dimensions and measurements that um, would be required, such as distances from the boundaries, maximum heights to the ridge, 
and minimum parking. This is a similar example, but for one of the restricted um, blue hash site plots, um, where at the top of the plot passport, you can see that it's restricted to two or three bedrooms to, main, to retain compliance with policy CP2. Um, here we have an example of some um, indicative floor plans um, for one of those restricted plots. This is an example of a three bed uh, where they can choose the location of the bathroom to the front of the, front of the dwelling or the rear of the dwelling here. And on the ground floor, there is a selection of different um, entrance ways, positioning of uh, ground floor WCs and storage. Uh, here we have um, an example of some of the customizable options. Um, in column one, you can see the options for garaging, ranging from none at all to lean tos and attached garages. Column two shows the options available for porches and entranceways. Column three shows the options available for chimneys or flues. Column four shows um, potential bays. Five shows um, facades where they could choose different materials to accentuate various features within the building. And six shows possibilities to extend within the purple hatched area, which would be within the plot pass force. Here we have um, the materials schedule and palettes that would be available. So at the top, you can see four types of brick. Below that, there are two types of cladding, um, sorry, wood cladding, as well as some tile hanging. There are four types of roof options. And below that, there is a colour selection for um, accessories such as window finishes and door finishes. On the right hand side, there's some external hard landscaping options. So there are two types of um, block pavers, two types of resin, and there is a selection of colours ranging from sandy colours all the way through to this grey for loose gravel. Here we have an example of um, an indicative street scene within the site. And then we move on to some photos of the area. And at the top, this is a photo taken from the footpath just off the church. You can see the existing building here to the stables. And below it, this is a view from Durleybrook Road, where you can see the same building here. At the top and bottom here, this is the view into the site from between some of the houses along Durleybrook Road. This is the view from of the site from Church Lane, one of the accesses into the um, agricultural land that's adjacent to the site. And below it is a view of the site from the footpath leading from the school. Um, here is a view of the proposed pedestrian crossing. Uh, this is from the footpath looking towards the school where you can see just about see the um, bus stop at the bottom here and at the bottom you can see where the bus stop is currently this would be infilled with um, grass and a wider footpath as well as the pedestrian crossing opposite the school
At the top here, we have the existing access to the site. You can see there is some informal parking along the entranceway here that's currently used um, by parents to walk to the school to pick up their children. At the bottom here is the existing car parking area and some buildings. There are a few more of the buildings around. There is um, a shop here and a cafe. A few more of the buildings around the site. Here at the top, you can see the existing hedgerow. This would be retained. And at the bottom, this is the existing uh, grazing land that would be turned into open space with tree planting or wild, wildflower planting. A few more photos of where the larger open space would be located. And finally, we have some views of the neighbouring properties from within the site. Um, at the top, these two would um, be mostly overlooking the proposed new open space. The one on the right hand side would have a building in front of it. And on the bottom, this is, um, you can just see the existing properties onto the cursor here, and this would become um, one of the plots. The recommendation is to refuse. Thank you, Lewis. Um, we now move to the public speakers. Um, now, um, there are two objectors, and then when we get to the um, supporter, there is a cast of quite a few. Um, could I just remind those two sections that you have three minutes to put your case. If you wish to um, just have one person speaking out, out of those nominated and bring the other person stroke people in for um, information, should there be any questions, that's fine. But I shall cut you off according to our rules after three minutes. So please, if you're sharing your slot, please decide who is going first and then who's going second or third or fourth or however many you are. Um, but um, it would be a pity if you just have one person speaking and the other person wanted to speak. So I hope you've already sorted that out. So we move to objectors. We have Mrs. Catherine Phillips. Is she here? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Ms. Molly, you're going to be doing the speaking. Yes, and then you can be available, Mrs. Phillips, to answer any questions, should there be any. So thank you very much for coming along today. And when you're ready, Mrs. Molly, you have three minutes. And there's a clock on the screen to let you know how your three minutes is going. There we are. Yes. We feel any development should reflect what is agreed in the local plan, otherwise why have a, a plan? This development doesn't fit the criteria for policy MTRA 3 or 4, DM 15 or 23 and SF 17 among others. Self-build does not trump local planning law and does not justify departure from planning policy. Custom build is not affordable housing, it's just development by another name. There is no clear support for this development in the community. If the next local plan requires Derby to take a few more houses, any planning for this should be community-led by the parish council, not developer-led. There's a huge amount of development all around the, the boundaries of Derby. These more than satisfy any local demand for housing in the, in the wider area. Derby is a strategic green space between all these surrounding developments. This proposed development of a site outside the established settlement would have an unacceptable effect on the rural character of the village and set a dangerous precedent. Durley has poor infrastructure, including poor bus service, poor mobile phone reception and slow broadband. There's only a small school, a church and two pubs. 
In the response to consulty responses and objections, Wessex Planning says, quote, it is evident that Derby is slowly becoming depleted of its vitality. We have a community hall used by many organisations throughout the week, a flourishing preschool, excellent parish magazine, WI book group, active church, an amazing annual fate, and newly installed gym equipment in our recreation ground. In criticising the current settlement hierarchy, Wessex Planning states that all day-to-day -day services and employment in Durley can be accessed online. Home working for the doctors, teachers, electricians, plumbers, and air traffic controllers who live in the village? Really? Anyway, try home working with slow broadband. Try returning online purchases. No post office, so a car journey. No bus link to the hospital. Volunteers take the elderly to their appointments through our Good Neighbours Scheme, another one of our village organisations. Wessex Planning also criticised the Parish Council for not representing the views of those in the community who support some housing development in the village. Where are all the letters of support for this development from those villagers? I counted one on the planning side. The main road through Durley is already a rat run. It's very narrow in places with no pavement for much of its length and is designated unsuitable for HGVs. Many concerns about an extra 40 plus cars coming onto this road, plus the merry lot, very many lorry movements during construction, all taking place near the school. The proposed parking is too far from the church and anyway, without enforceable regulation, will be taken over by excess parking for the new houses. New equestrian businesses have opened in the area, indicating high demand, a demand that can only increase. Cobb is an important part of the rural economy, providing local jobs as well as an important leisure facility in the village and should be retained. Has the business at Quad been allowed to decline so that this application could be made? Would it be successful under new management? This application represents a significant and intrusive development in a rural community. The motive appears to be more about profit for the developer than community value. Thank you very much. I'm dead on three minutes, well done. Um, so are there any questions for Mrs Phillips or Mrs Money? No. So thank you very much for coming along today. Um, we now move on to the Parish Council representative, Councillor Gabe, is it, Rapini? Good morning. Good morning. Um, the Parish Council's stance on this, it's, it's a very significant development. It can't be classed as any type of infill. The proposal does not come under policy MTRA 4. It's not fulfilling a need for local people, agricultural workers or affordable housing. Neither does it fall under policy MTRA 3 of the current Winchester plan. And Durley Parish has absolutely no allocation to any new housing currently. If or when Durley gets an allocation for housing, it should be parish led, not developer led. Residents have indicated through a recent consultation with the Parish Council that they prefer smaller style starter homes to be built. This proposal does not match these indications. Despite stating that some of the proposed properties are two bedroom, each plot will include an annex which could significantly incre increase the property size. The proposal also includes a new school crossing, village shop and jib. As was discovered by the last of our village shops to close, the idea of a shop is, is a nice thought but ultimately unsustainable. Pump funding has a finite time and then the business becomes unviable. It's the opinion of the Durley Parish Council that an equestrian business is far more viable as proven by the growing number of smaller equestrian businesses still developing within the village. The applicant refers to a gym, which was an aspiration of residents and which Durley Parish Council has followed up from the Durley Parish plan. In June, 2021, because it didn't go in sooner because of the COVID rules. Gym equipment was installed at Durley Parish by Durley Parish Council at the recreation ground for the use of residents. This proposal also includes school crossing, which Durley Parish Council believes is in a far more dangerous position than the current school crossing. The current school crossing has only recently been added after years of hard lobbying for Durley School. And, and the, the parish also believes that the, the proposal of the bus pull-in to be removed will be detrimental to road survey to, to road safety. Uh, we'd like to thank the case officer for their recommendation of refusing, and we totally agree with their comments and fully support their recommendations. Thank you very much, Councillor Rapini. Um, there might be some questions of clarification from the committee. Councillor Pearson. <laughs> If I may ask clarification, Tom is right at the end. About Could the you talk into the microphone, please, Tom? Because it's being Tom is right at the end of your comment about the bus stop. 
Uh, are, you, are you saying that there's no proposal? It's not just moving the bus stop, it's actually removing the bus stop. Uh, it's my belief that the, the bus stop is going to be taken away and the pavement moved up to where the outside of the bus stop is now. Does Do the buses uh, deliver any of the children to the primary school? Though? I don't think the buses deliver to the primary school um, because the, the generally parents take their, their kids in themselves. Yes, I know um, just. It's a bit of a tight spot. Yes. Um, however, the, the local senior school buses stop there. They yep. collect children from there and they go to the Wyvern School of Faro and, and drop off as well on the opposite side. Okay, thank you very much. So I think that's it, um, Councillor. So thank you very much for coming along and speaking to us today. Um, now we're moving to ward councillors, but I can only see one. Um, Councillor Kern and Councillor Miller not speaking today. Uh, not on this particular item, no. No, OK. So you have five minutes, Councillor Kern, when you're ready. And you've noticed where the timer is in the top left hand corner. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I thank the committee for allowing me to speak on this application today and thank the officers and welcome the recommendation to refuse this application. This proposal deeply concerns the residents in my ward. In recent times across the country, we're seeing more and more aggressive planning applications from developers who feel they can come into our communities and get what they want. With no proper dialogue with parish councils and residents, applications filled with lobbied support from people who have never visited the area or live far afield, resident surveys sent to homes outside of the area concerned, and glossy brochures and flashy websites which give the impression it's a done deal before we've even got to the stage that we're at today. Durley is one of the many jewels of the Crown in our district, a village with a rich history, one that has sustainably grown over hundreds of years, but it now finds itself in a precarious position. Durley shares a border with Eastleigh Borough Council, who seem to want to build right up to that line, with 3,278 new homes having been built in the last three years, and Bishop Swartham, which is also seeing its own share of large development. This administration has declared a climate emergency and allowing valuable pieces of countryside to be concreted over, in my opinion, very much contradicts that emergency response. The environmental impact on the village would be huge, with a whole host of wildlife being forced away due to the works and also by the homes and their impact once built. Durley doesn't have the infrastructure to support such a development. It has one main road, which is incredibly narrow in parts, and a development to this degree isn't suitable at all. 23 new homes in one location on its only main road. With an irregular bus service, our dependence on cars would see a minimum of 40 cars in and out of the village daily. Add on to this the influx of traffic from Hedge End and Bishop's Waltham to access amenities on either side of the village. This would turn Durley into even more of a rat run than it currently is. There is no village centre, and although this development proposes a gym and a community shop, it wouldn't be sustainable. As we've already heard, the village previously had a village shop, which is no longer there due to the competition of larger stores in close proximity. This project advertises itself as a custom build venture, but let's not kid ourselves. If the demand isn't there for custom build, instead of not building the houses, the developer will build them anyway, and they'll be sold like every other development. So trying to sneak proposals in under the guise of self-build is incredibly misleading to this committee and residents. I know that the MP for South Norfolk, the government's ambassador for right to build, supports this project after careful scrutiny. I wrote to the Member of Parliament and asked if that scrutiny included a site visit, considering that the post school crossing is on a dangerous corner. I understand this will also be one of the last pieces of work to be carried out. Therefore, taking away the current crossing and parking will create a dangerous environment for road users and children at the school while this development takes place, which of course could take years. I also pointed out to the right honourable gentleman the geography of the village and its infrastructure, but sadly I didn't hear back from Mr Bacon. Our MP Flick Drummond has added to the comments that an MP's support carries no more weight than that of a member of the public in such matters. Durley Parish Council are incredibly supportive when it comes to planning and development. They only object when there's real cause for concern, and having sat in on many Parish Council meetings, I can personally vouch for that. They approach all applications with a fair and balanced approach, which protects the best interests of the village, while also planning for the future and understanding you have to allow some development. Durley is working on its village plan. They and the residents want to have homes that are affordable and fit with the character of the village. Durley has no housing allocation. This proposal does not fall within a settlement boundary and therefore does not fit with criteria of policy MTRA 3. 
Durley wants its voice to be heard when it comes to development. For example, can we see a row of six terrace houses with the middle properties unable to be overextended, meaning they maintain some level of affordability as time progresses? Homes that young families of the village can move into, homes that the first time buyers who have grown up in the village can afford, and homes our key workers, workers can afford, community-led development. To purchase a £400,000 plus home at the minute, you would currently need an income of around £80,000 a year to get a mortgage. That's before you've even considered a deposit. These properties will clearly not be affordable for first time buyers and our key workers who have been invaluable to us in the last 18 months. And therefore, in my opinion, it does not meet MTRA4 as it does not meet the criteria of providing development in the countryside for a local need, agricultural workers or as a site for affordable housing. Recently, five self-built custom plots in Denmead were rejected by this committee, and I feel such site being much larger and having a more of a negative impact should also be rejected. In conclusion, having grown up in Derby, I can assure you this isn't just the community saying not in my backyard. This is a community saying we have serious concerns about this project, a community saying we want to be heard and we want to protect our countryside for the future. It's a community which is already being ignored when it comes to enforcement. And I urge this committee to hear these concerns, follow the advice of the officers and reject this application, as in my opinion, this would set a very dangerous precedent for our communities moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kern. Any question for clarification? One Lord Councillor? No. So thank you very much for uh, your contributions today. So we move on to supporters. Um, and we have the agent, um, Louise Cutts, and I see that you've got um, Steve Jenkins for Transport, Naomi Kressweiler for, from Consular Limited, and Paul Fazy from Architecture PLB. Do I assume that you will be doing the main speaking? Yes. And then the others are there to advise on any specialist questions. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So when you're ready, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Working with a long-standing member of the village community and the village school, this application is brought to members as one that fulfills evidence local community aspirations and is therefore in complete accordance with your local plan MTRA3. The design objection was a surprise as this is an outline application for the housing element with future reserve matters applications giving the council complete control over the design of each plot. Likewise, the submitted Section 106 agreement addresses the Solent's disturbance issues. There are no technical objections to this proposal and your landscape officer fully supports the proposals on the basis that a landscape enhancement would be achieved. A 77% uplift in biodiversity net gain would also be achieved and surface water flow rates into the nearby stream are likely to be reduced by employing a sustainable drainage strategy. In terms of the development principle then, planning guidance explains that custom-built housing provides more affordable route towards home ownership. It's not traditional housing, uh, affordable housing as we know it, but it does look to fill that gap between eligibility for traditional affordable housing and the inability to purchase a house on the open, mar open market. It also allows complete customisation to fulfil a variety of housing needs that are not generally met by volume house builders. The Section 106 agreement ensures that the plots would be marketed only to those people registered on the local self and custom bill register with a cascade system to ensure Derby residents get first choice. The Parish Council surveyed their residents in 2015 and 2020, resulting respectively in 23% and 17% support for new housing in the village. Using your planning officer's figures of 450 households in Derby, that equates to up to 76 households in Derley supporting more housing within the village. These surveys also evidence two other community aspirations. Firstly, the need to address highway safety concerns caused by parent parking outside the school, and secondly, for a village shop. Now, Mrs Boyes, the landowner, was clear from the start that these aspirations should be included in the scheme. Mrs Boyes, the village school and Hampshire Highways have all been involved in the park and stride element of the scheme and fully support the provision of a parent parking area and a safe off-road pedestrian route to school. Additionally, a building gifted to the parish council gives the community its best chance for a viable community shop or any multi-purpose alternative should a shop fail. To finish then, the proposal is com in complete accordance with policy MTRA3 because the community aspirations have been identified through a legitimate process with clear support shown by, shown by a significant minority. The policy does not require majority support as this would be discriminatory. Additionally, there are many other benefits 
of these proposals and these are listed in the briefing note that was prepared and sent to members. As such, we hope that members can not only support this scheme, but are as enthused by this scheme as we are. This is an important community project for Durley. Thank you. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for the agent and her team? Councillor Pearson. Uh, Ms. Cuts, the I'm looking at the proposed layouts and landscaping uh, map that you, well, pictogram, I guess it is, that you've uh, provided for us. Uh, query about the swale, and I presume that the attenuation pond. Now, are you aware that, that this is a corner that pretty well floods every time we get heavy rain? Yes. Yes, you are. OK, the swell does not seem to be connected to the attenuation pond. So how is the square swell going to slow down the runoff from those fields? Could you put your microphone on? Thank you. We completed a, a full flood risk assessment, which shows that um, in terms of that flooding, we won't make it any worse and we're possibly going to make it better. In fact, very likely to by uh, reducing the rate of runoff over what is mostly clay into the stream. I don't know if Rose has a flood risk assessment on us, but there's a quite a helpful map in there that tells us the um, direction of flow and how that would attenuate flow into the stream. So it's very likely that at the moment the um, the rate of runoff is is quite fast and that we could be um, attenuating that quite significantly. Yeah. So, so perhaps so you've the just flooding done a, situation just, better. You've just done a desktop assessment about it, have you? No, we've had a full flood risk assessment. Okay. I, I remember a village called Farringdon where they did a desktop thing and they had to rebuild all the houses because they flooded. Um, the, it, it, uh, I mean, I, I've got to say that that worries me. Uh, knowing what the flooding record of that corner is right by that school. Uh, the crossings as well, if I might ask something about the crossings you're proposing. Are those what are technically called uncontrolled crossings, i.e. zebra crossings plus Belisha beacons? I'll ask um, our transport consultant to respond to that, if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, the crossings will be uncontrolled crossings, so there won't be Belisha beacons or Zebra crossings, just drop curbs, tactile paving, and suitable visibility displays on in each direction. It will replace the existing crossing up by the Cobb Stables entrance, which has been recently installed um, by Hampshire County Council, but it's actually quite a poor crossing. The, the one side of it is drop curbs with tactile paving. The northern side into the stables shares the, the driveway access into the stable. So it isn't inclusive or accessible. It's actually quite a poor new crossing. The new crossing directly opposite the school will be built to modern standards and has been discussed in detail with the school and also with the bus operator and with the county council who are in full support of its location and design. I'm going to ask a final question for you. Regarding the parking that you propose is for the school, how many parking places are you suggesting the school would need on your site? Uh, uh, in relation to the amount of parking that's presently on roadside? Um, certainly, um, the, the application is supported by a, a car parking survey, so we conducted an actual survey of people counting the number of cars that were parked both within the site, because the site owner currently allows people to park on her land in the morning and the afternoon to, to wait to to school and pick their children up. Um, so that was that those people were counted. We also counted the number of parents who are parked in four separate zones along Durley Brook Road, some of which are in a lay-by at the four or five. The majority of parents either park on the site or just park on the pavement uh, and open doors across the footway or open doors into the carriageway. It is a significant problem. Um, we have counted in the morning. Um, it's a little bit peaky so with 15 minutes the maximum occupation on the street or on the site in a 15 minute period is is 28 spaces um that's not that's not to say that's all the people that drive to school there are many more but they come it's staggered so time yeah. someone comes drops off and goes it, it works out at a maximum any 15 minute period of, of 28 so the, the space is on site in purpose-built car parks with direct connectivity to the improved public rights of way 
is 30 spaces. So we've, we've specified it in excess of what the maximum fee minute demand was. And it should remove all the parking from the street, from the pavement, um, and from the uh, informal access arrangement into purpose-built car parks with direct access to the public right of way. Similarly with the crossing, this has been discussed in, in detail with the school who are in full support of it, with the county council as both highway authority and through their school travel team. They are all in support. They are uh, committed to um, promoting the new car parking arrangements because it is accepted and acknowledged by both those parties that it's a far preferable solution from people bumping up onto pavements and unloading children onto roads effectively, which is, which is what happens now and has done for the last 10 years. With during that period, there's been numerous attempts to resolve the problem, public money being spent on various measures, none of which have been successful. Our, our, our client's land is, is the best solution that's there at the moment, and she allows that to happen, but it, it will be fundamentally improved through our, our proposals. Well, all I can say is good luck with that proposal. Trying to find parking for school is like rather like trying to fill a bath without the plug in. Thank you very much. Um, any further questions, Councillor Leeming? With regard to the open space uh, land that you're showing here, who will own it when the development's finished? The residents will own it and it will be um, maintained by a management company. So it could be developed in the future? With permission from yourselves, which I, I very much doubt you would give on a, an area of public open space. Correct. Uh, also, do you own the land on which the footpaths are going to be put on? The, yes, the, the, the public rights point runs across land within our, our ownership. The, the, contrary to what was said earlier, the footpath is not going to be realigned. It will just have its surface improved. And again, we've agreed the detail of that with the County Council's countryside services, a compacted hogging surface effectively on that same alignment with connections from the school car parks direct to the front door of the school. Any, any further questions? So thank you very much, um, Louis, for bringing your specialist team along today and yourself. Um, Rose, do you have anything you wish to pick up from? Oh, thank you. OK, um, could I just say something about the reports? Because some of it was really difficult to read. Um, and I don't know whether this is just something that just came from the developer. But if we look at page 74, even with a magnifying glass, I couldn't read that. Um, and then it did improve in quality of legibility, but then it was all blurred. So the next two pages on, with all the options, um, was blurred. So could we just ensure whoever puts these reports together that you know, they are um, council friendly? Because these, these ones. Anyway, let's move on to principle of development. Um, I, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I would quite like um, an explanation of um, customs. Yeah, I just wanted to, to ask about the custom um, self build, and then I'll put you down, um, Mike, for the next question. I know, I've just said. Who's going to talk about the. I presume that CSB and SCB are the same thing, is that right? Yes, Chair. Yeah. So, um, as a council, we have a duty to provide a certain amount of custom and self build. Um, dwellings. These are um, done within base periods, um, which last, I believe, for about three years. So oh, once the base period has, year has closed, we then have three years in order to meet the requirement for that base period. Uh, for example, the um, policy officer highlighted that in base period one, in 2016, we were required to allocate 35 plots, um, and at the end of 
the period after that, 2019, we had permitted 102 custom and self-build. Uh, the following year, we required uh, 53 plots and the um, closing period was 2020. We permitted 38, which is approximately 32% of its demand. Um, there is a slight shortfall for the second base period, but we have been in contact with the task force um, and they have confirmed with us that the over provision for the first base period more than makes up for the lack of provision on the second base period. So we are meeting our current need. Um, were there any further? No, um, yes, I think it's obviously it's going to be a new trend because this is the second time we've had them out the planning committee. So where does the, um, you're saying that in, in various phases we have a target, where does that target come from? I don't know, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's not a question I thought to ask the policy. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. okay, but and uh, for, for this application purposes, um, we are ahead of our target. Yes, if that's the word. Yeah. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Joe. I just think it might be useful if um, Mrs Pinnock can actually explain to us the um, nature of an outline application, because as we saw in some of the presentations, it referred to indicative layouts or indicative builds, etc. So a reminder that what, what we're looking for at this point in time. Um, so in usual times, we would have a full application which provides full details of an application. Um, for an outline application, you can submit partial details or very limited details. In this case, this is a hybrid application, so they have provided details for the um, business or community building, for the landscaping and open space, and for the highways information regarding the crossings and the general layout of the site, um, which was shown in my original slide there. With me. Yeah. Um, so we have the open space, the parking, the general layout and the community building here. That was all part of the detailed application. Where it comes to the outline application, we are looking at the size, mass, scale of individual dwellings per plot. And the plots have been indicated on the site here. Um, and their finishing materials, and they would all be informed by the um, information that they have been have been submitted. In this case, the design code has been submitted for agreement, um, and we found this lacking, which is why it's formed part of the reasons for refusal. Does that help? Yeah, it, it's. Would it be fair to say that the indicative areas could actually change? In, the full application. in this instance, no. Um, the layout has, would be agreed at this point. So the outline is purely in relation to what each individual dwelling would end up like in terms of scale, mass, size, design, and um, materials finishes. That's the outline element of this. Thank you, Chair. Could you just explain to us um, on this particular type of development why we don't insist on affordable housing being included in that? Uh, so some of the changes to the MPPF have included um, self and custom build as a type of affordable housing, which is what the um, agent is arguing as a reason not to include specific affordable housing that would comply with our policies. Um, so 
in this case, they have said that self and custom build is more affordable and has been identified as more affordable within the national uh, the national planning policy guide framework. Um, whereas our policies require um, truly affordable house um, affordable housing in terms of social and affordable rent and help to buy. And um, there's slight difference in what the MPPF require and what our policy require. However, our policy is up to date and that is where we should be starting. So should we move on then to um, design and layout, which is on page 53? So can I ask? Um, Rose, exactly which buildings are being demolished? Is it all of Cobb's Gables? Or... Yes, Jen. All of them. Yes. No further questions? So well, two of them. You have branched in this direction. I'll get my finger up. I didn't. Um, well, fingers I can't see. Hands. Well, hand, can. pen. Yeah, um, pen is lovely. On the fourth, fifth paragraph down, it refers to footpath 12. I'm quite happy to leave that question until the highways, which also covers footpath 12. It's up to you, whichever one you want to do. I'm so sorry, I didn't quite catch what you sure. I, I think it was um, the presenting, presiding, the presenting officer said that the footpath would be altered or could be altered. Mr. Jenkins said that it was not to be altered. Which is it, please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did say it would be altered um, mainly to accommodate the additional linkages into the parking. So I do apologise that I wasn't quite clear enough in that respect. Um, the overall layout of the um, footpath will not change. It will just have bits added to it to link it to the new development. Councillor Edward. Uh, thank you. I'm referring to the top paragraph on page 54, uh, where it said that while the proposals offer an acceptable starting point in terms of the overall layout, the design code is not sufficient uh, to ensure a quality sense of place. Um, I'm wondering whether the lack of sufficiency is that the code is is that the proposals are not prescriptive enough and therefore custom build might be allowing too much variation of freedom or whether there is some area of consideration that the proposals simply don't cover about the nature of the development itself um, and i just wonder if you could say a little bit more about that and, and suggest how a self or custom build outline proposal could give sufficient reassure sufficient detail to to reassure thank you jeff and um, in this case we found the um proposed design code unacceptable because it was lacking overarching um features for the entire site that would tie it together. Um, we found that the options available were very broad um, and as a result um, it would lead to a development that would appear piecemeal in appearance rather than a holistic approach that would tie something together and would work with the village and in its entirety. The application was supported by a contextual analysis. Unfortunately, when we looked into this in comparison with the design code, we didn't feel that um, the contextual analysis was used enough to create more overarching um, features that would guide the development as a whole that would make it more acceptable. Does that answer your question? Um, it still leaves me wondering. Still leaves me wondering whether if a holistic uh, 
uh, approach to the site is required. It's not a, a custom or self built approach which could ever meet that requirement in certain parts of the group. I believe they can do. My concern in this case was that as it's a very large site, it re would require um, more detail in the overall design code. So, for example, um, they had four different types of brick. Um, they had various um, design features that would be available to every single dwelling, which in theory for a custom build house would work. Um, we had concerns in regard to corner plots and whether they should have um, a greater selection available. So for example, the urban designer raised um, concerns about um, only allowing corner plots to have a corner bay, which was one of the examples shown earlier. Um, we also had concerns about end vistas and um, using one particular material to um, join the entire um, development together as a holistic development. And uh, we also had concerns regarding roof forms, um, where the contextual analysis raised that gables and hips were the predominant feature of Durley. Um, this was raised with the agent, but they didn't feel um, that the nature of a custom build would comply if we turn, if we included restrictions such as not including flat roof dwellings within the site. Things like that made it insufficient, in my opinion, in order to create a well, well rounded and um, good public space, as well as a good development as a whole. Okay, Councillor okay. Pearson. Thank you, Chair. I think we've jumped a gun a little bit here. Can I ask some fundamental questions about the principle of development on the, on this site? As I understand it, Durley is a disseminate, disseminated settlement, linear shape broadly. Uh, this site is countryside. Uh, can you, uh, it's not as far as I'm aware, a Shiva site for future development. It did not, Durley did not have any housing allocation on the present allocation of housing. So how has this application, after pre-application advice, got as far as it has? Um, so in this case, um, the applicant did come forward with pre-application advice. We advised them that it would be unlikely to receive officer support. However, we did give them guidance should they wish to pursue. It's completely up to them how they move forward. Um, but yes, I I agree that the um, settlement is an MTRA3 settlement. It has no boundary. The application site would be behind the existing row of development and so would not comply in that respect. Um, the applicant also made the argument that the proposal would meet a community need and function for the settlement as a whole, which was why they decided to progress to this point, I believe. To, to test it at this stage. May I ask a question about that, Chairman? Uh, you're saying that their argument, the, that their research has suggested there is a need for this housing, although you still haven't explained how this site is acceptable under the present local plan, or indeed I understand it in the emerging local plan. Um, do our figures, housing figures, also suggests that actually is a need for housing in Derby. The parish council seems to suggest that there is not a need. So the council currently has in excess of five-year land supply. Indeed. Um, 
I believe there are 11 people on the custom and self-build housing list looking for a site in Durley. However, I don't believe that that um, trumps our local plan policies. So currently, um, my assessment has concluded that the site does not comply with NTRA 3 and NTRA 4. Yeah, okay, thank you, Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, Councillor, no. do we have any more? No. Um, right, so we are still moving through the, the chapters on design and layout. I'm glad you asked that question, Councillor Pearson, because I was about to go back and ask about MTRA 3 and MTRA 4, which are very important policies. Um, so we're on impact of the character of the area and neighbouring property. If we're not going to ask any questions on that, then anything else on the report? Landscape and trees, highways and parking. Uh, landscape and trees. I just, Sorry, I just wanted to read out the heading. Okay, sure. Ecology um, and the solar special protection area and planning balance. That's the Yeah, looking at the landscape and trees photograph, which is on page 55, uh, <clears throat> you heard me ask the uh, agent and indeed the architect about, <clears throat> about this swale and this attenuation pond. Uh, based on the information as Rose has presented us, frankly, I can't see how that is going to solve the existing runoff onto that corner, which uh, to my knowledge, because I know this site pretty well going through it um, regularly, uh, how that is going to reduce the flooding, in other words, the drainage of these fields. Uh, that is a concern. Uh, so could you explain how they're arguing that in your view, uh, Rose? Um, because you don't mention the attenuation pond, although it is in the diagrams. The swale does not seem to connect with the attenuation pond. So I can't see how the swale is going to reduce flooding of the road. So as I understand it, um, there is a current issue with the runoff, so that, that is why they've placed... Um, That's an understatement. <laughs> that's why they've placed the um, larger swale in that location. Yeah. The idea is that the runoff would go into that swale and it would then um, be transferred at yeah. a slower rate into the um, stream that runs adjacent. Yes, I agree. That, that's what I would argue as well, but it doesn't. But it's not according to that map. That map is just the landscaping map. I haven't got a picture of the drainage, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, there is some details on the application um, file, yeah. including a flood risk assessment that has been found acceptable by the Hampshire Highway, the Hampshire Flood and Surface Water team. Do I, if I may ask, do our drainage people agree that that actually will reduce flooding on that corner by the school? Yes, the drainage officer was satisfied with the proposals. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Pearson, you did ask the agent that question. Um, she I, I, I know it did, but yeah. uh, the agent is in favour of the application. Yeah, yeah, but, I'm but, but oh, yes. just in the interest of equality, pointing out to the committee that you, you asked the agent, who said she was happy with the arrangement. Um, right, so um, any further questions on the report? Any aspect? So can we move on to debate? Jenny, before you move on to debate, mm -hmm. I wanted to um, uh, apologise for the lateness of this. I did, having looked at the report again today and hearing the questions, I did want to suggest we expand the reason for refusal one slightly. And before you debate, maybe it would be helpful if like I told you that earlier. Um, so obviously our reason for refusal one talks about the proposal being contrary to um, NTRA 3 and NTRA 4. Uh, and these additional dwellings, in our view, are without justification. I think it'd be helpful, given that this is uh, promoted as a, a customer self-build scheme, that we, add, we expand that reason for refusal and add that there is no justification 
for making an exception to the policy that we've quoted as the provision of South and custom build housing does not override other development plan policies and the council can demonstrate an adequate supply of housing land, uh, including for South building custom housing. So I just want to put on the beneficial chair. Yeah, absolutely. Is that an addition to um, condition one or is it as it good as a number? No, it'd be, uh, in a, it, would, it would expand a uh, reason for refusal one. So the gist of it is that the custom staff build on um, no. you, 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 you tell me again what yeah. just uh, it, the, the, the custom itself build doesn't override our development plan policies and we can demonstrate an adequate supply of housing land so it would just be an expansion to reason for refusal yeah. one yeah thank you thank you chair thank you debate Councillor Pearson sorry chair but shown to me I, I'm looking, you know, looking at the policies that Rose mentioned and looking also at the issues that the Parish Council rose, uh, raised and my knowledge of this village, which goes back half a century, I guess. Uh, I cannot see how this application fits our policies in that, as I, as I said to the agent, oh, so, sorry, to Rose, it's abs there is no development boundary of Derby. It's a linear development, basically a disseminated village. And previous plans have deemed that this is not suitable for development other than infill, which Derby has had quite a fair degree. So it's also that means it's in the countryside. Uh, and the countryside policies generally are against effectively a building site which what this is, whether it's a custom built, self built, commercial, whatever, it's it's not uh, deemed as affordable under an exception site. Uh, I kind of can't see how you could custom build uh, makes it affordable generally. So even there are there are eleven people on a housing register, unless those particular individuals are going to roll their sleeves up, start building these houses. I can't see it's a self build either. Someone is going to build it, i.e., it's a commercial development. Uh, so that is one thing I find it very difficult to say. Right, okay, we've got to override our planning policies because it's not. I know sometimes I do, but this is a major aspect in a village that really is not enough. It has no amenities, this village. And uh, the already is a cafe in Court Stables. And I must admit, I, I can guess some of the neighbours are going to be delighted to see the Court Stable building gone. Because, to say the least, it's an eyesore when you're used to looking at the countryside, which they did. Because it suddenly appeared, I, I don't know, sort of uh, permitted development of some sort. I don't know. Um, when it comes down to the drainage, and even though you're saying that, uh, and I know the agent said we've we've looked at this advice, but it was a desktop study. Our drainage engineers said, yeah, this will do the job to reduce flooding that does regularly, and I mean regularly, and it's quite a pond on that corner by that school. I'm also very nervous about the um, the crossing that is suggested for this. Uh, if it was a Belisha Beacon Zebra Crossing, I could see an argument in favour of it, but just to have drop curves where pupils may cross and a removal of a bus stop, which is perhaps not used by the primary school, but certainly used by secondary age children to go to either down toward to uh, Wilden in Hedge End or to Slomore, uh, which is they would need a bus for that. I, again, I cannot see, and that comes in compass of the outline planning commission. Uh, so there are two things. The biodiversity is, I know that there'll be, I'm sure there's a great deal more detail on the file on online, uh, and I, I regret I haven't had a chance to read it, but the information we've given, biodiversity is very, very minimal. I mean, you make a comment about reptile, if you can't you find a reptile. I'm not, frankly, I'm not surprised, Rose, because it's you, what your photographs show us are, are paddocks that are overgrazed. So if there is any valuable plant or wildlife on those fields, they've long since been trampled underfoot. So any biodiversity gain is going to be a plus factor. 
which is in favour of this application. But that doesn't overcome the basic fact. It is not within our local plan policies, which is, I suspect, why you've said, I'm sorry, this I'm recommending refusal, and that's what you say in this, which I've got to say, I can't see any reason for it being built. Thank you. Any further contribution? And I agree with Councillor McPherson. Um, and uh, I agree totally with the parish council. Um, all community, um, all new housing in Derby should be led by the community. And the developer has put the most enormous amount of work in it. I do appreciate that. Of, you know what the development could look like and um, all the very full details not all of which we can read but um, you know that isn't a reason um, to grant permission because basically it is against MTRA3 its countryside and MTRA4 um, which only allows ribbon development and um, there's no housing currently allocated to Derby and uh, so this remains very much under the policies of MTRA 4 and 3 um, and uh, the, um, that's why we intend to add on the addition to um, in proposal 1 for refusal that custom self-build doesn't take uh, precedence over our policies um, and uh, I agree with that. I just don't think, and there, there doesn't seem to be a proven need for these custom self build uh, properties. And we've heard from the case officer that we are ahead with our targets um, after phase two. So um, I, I see no reason to grant permission for this development. It's recommended for refusal with the addition as stated by um, the uh, service lead for built environment, Mrs. Finnick. Um, all those in favour of refusing this application, please show. Is that eight, eight members, Chair? And against. In other words, not. And abstentions, one. So that application is refused for the reasons set out on page 58 plus the additional sentence to uh, reason one. Normally, um, I was planning to have a break here. We've got two more applications to do this morning or before two o'clock. Um, what would you, how would you like to play it, Councillor? I require a few yeah, oh yeah, we'll have a short break anyway because we've got to sanitize all the stuff. Do you want a longer break is the question. No going on. So when we're all back, we'll start again.
Oh, no, it's okay. We're just waiting for them to pop it anyway. So, have we got Amanda Moore? Yeah, good morning. So, I think we're ready to start. Um, so, the um, agenda item H is the garage block numbers one to six Southbrook Cottages, Mitchell Dever. Um, the reference number 21 stroke 01279 stroke FUL. Um, removal of the existing garages and construction of a single two storey building for affordable housing containing four one bed flats and two two bed flats with associated cycle and refuge storage and car parking. Um, this is an applicant an application from Winchester City Council. I just would like to point out for the record that the we treat all applications the same. And so the committee is well used to dealing with um, applications from within the council and um, will treat this exactly the same as any other application in front of us. So the case officer is Verity Murphy and she's just sorting out her presentation. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. No, um, so the application site is shown in red on this location plan. Here we have a satellite image of the site, which is shown here. South Brick Cottages is characterised by residential properties and to the west of the site there are allotments. These two photographs show the existing garages and parking on the site, which will be removed through this application. Uh, excuse me, Chem, the, uh, the laptop has died. Technology is wonderful when it works, doesn't it? For those listening to the recording, uh, we are having trouble with the presentation slide and trying to get those to work. Yeah. I'm just going to draw a different extension there. Well,
Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. So I'll just refresh um, on the screen. So the application site is shown here on a satellite image. There are allotments to the west and the surrounding properties in the Southport cottages, cottages are residential. We have the existing garages and parking as shown in these photographs and these will be removed under this application. Here we have the existing site plan. You can see the garages and parking areas. This is the proposed site plan, so there will be a building comprised of the six flats on the site with parking to the front. This top photograph is looking back at the application site, which is shown here by those row of garages. This bottom photograph is uh, taken in Duke Street, looking back towards the application site, which is shown here. This is the proposed eastern elevation of the building. So this will be the one which faces onto the road to Southbrook Cottages. At the ground floor level, there are three entrances on the front and the upper levels will be clad in timber. This is the proposed rear elevation. So this is the one which will face onto the allotments to the west of the, of the site as shown in this bottom photograph, the upper floors, the flats have balconies on the rear. This is the proposed north elevation. So this is the one that will face um, numbers one and two Southbrook cottages. The balconies have privacy screens and timber louvers to stop any harmful overlooking to that neighbouring property. And the blank elevation here is broken up with some brick detailing. This is the proposed south elevation. Again, the balconies have privacy, privacy screens on, um, and this is a bin store. This is uh, the proposed street scene. So you can see the distance between the application sites and the neighbouring properties either side. This is a photo of numbers one and two Southbrook cottages. You can just see the edge of the garages on the application site in the left hand corner. Here we have the proposed floor plans. So on the ground floor will be three flats. Flat one has two bedrooms and flat two and three have one bedroom. Again, there are three flats on the first floor. Flat four has two bedrooms and flat five and six are one bedroom and each of these upper floor flats has a rear balcony. This is the proposed landscaping plan. So there'll be tree planting and landscaping to the front of the site to soften the parking areas. There'll also be native hedging planted along the um, footpath to the south of the site, which leads to the allotments behind as shown in this photograph here. Here we have a proposed visualisation. Um, so this is looking south along Southbrook Cottages. So here's the proposed building and the neighbouring property there. This is another visualisation looking north of the site. So the building here, numbers one and two Southbrook Cottages and number three Southbrook Cottages. The application is recommended for approval, Chair, and that's the end of my committee. Thank you. End of my presentation. Thank you very much, Verity. Um, right, so we move on to public speaking. And the first um, public speaker is an objector, Amanda Hall. Um, and good morning, Mrs. Hall. And 
you have three minutes when you're ready. Um, the, you can see in the left hand side of the screen, um, you can see the time counting down. That's just to show you um, how it is. After three minutes, I'll have to stop you, I'm afraid. Okay. But when you're ready, you have three minutes. I appreciate that I'm not the government will say that I <laughs> in a small rural village with no amenities and limited public transport, why is there currently a 40% social housing element? The proposed development of Southbrook consists of six flats. Apparently in autumn 2021, there will be an application for nine more social housing properties in Barrow Close. The proposed development in Southbrook Cottages has another six properties squashed into an already busy cul-de-sac. Car parking is very limited and delivery drivers really struggle. The properties will be lived in by two, three or more people as the council endeavour to house more families. Again, a huge knock-on effect on parking. The flats are small and not conducive to family living. Residents have been told this application will be for local people. They were told this was barren close, which didn't happen, they just went to whomever could afford them. Have all the objections from residents been taken seriously? as there are a lot of very unhappy happy elderly people residing in Southbrook that wouldn't normally complain. Residents who are also struggling with the current element of antisocial behaviour. Both the Parish Council and City Council have spoken about a housing survey, a survey that only appeared two weeks ago on the Winchester City Council website. This should ideally have been on the village website. Drainage is a huge issue as villagers have already been told we have reached sewage capacity. The application shows the drainage will be connected to a system that has reached capacity. How will that work? I've noticed that Winchester Urban Design commented on this application. Why? When the application is for a rural setting, I would agree the application would be far more fitting in an urban area. Have the police been consulted regarding this application? and the effects of putting more social housing in this part of the village. Do the planning committee intend to visit the site, taking into consideration all the concerns raised by residents and the impact this proposed development will have on a small community? This scheme ignores the concerns of local people. It has not been thought out properly and will have a lasting negative impact on the village. There has to be a balance between private and social housing in a small village like Mitchell the council needs to plan and develop realistically, not idealistically. If a private developer put this application to the council, I'm pretty sure it would be thrown out and definitely not supported by the parish council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there might be some questions of clarification for you from the committee. Any questions, members? No, so thank you very much for your contributions today. Um, then we have Ward Councillor, Councillor Caroline Horrell, and you have five minutes when you're ready. Um, Chair, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for um, allowing me to address the planning committee today as one of the Ward Councillors for Wanston and Mitchell Dever Ward. It is well documented that the Parish Council is keen to increase the number of affordable homes available in the community and to help residents who have a connection to the village through work or family to be able to live in Mitchell Dever. I too very much support this intention. We know that the requirement for affordable homes does vary but currently the Hampshire Home Choice Register indicates that we have 22 registered with a local housing need in, in uh, Mitchell Dever. 12 requiring one bedroom and five requiring two bedrooms. This information supports the need for more affordable homes in the parish and the type of accommodation is going to be highly appropriate. The use of land owned by Winchester City Council to build new homes is an excellent use of resources. 
We know the availability of suitable land is often a limiting factor for us. The garage site has been underused for many years and so has presented to us this really positive opportunity. Residents have lobbied us as ward councillors about the potential impact on parking in the area. A very constructive discussion has taken place and an improvement scheme devised. Officers confirmed to residents the housing development would not go ahead without the improved parking. Sadly, today we have been unable to process the planning permission required for the new parking, which is a pity. But I understand this will come forward to a future planning committee. I know officers would like to have the homes and parking improvements included in the same build contract. Therefore, I would ask the committee today to very specifically ensure that the commitment is confirmed that the homes and parking improvements will go hand in hand. Residents would feel let down if this was not the case. You know, Chair, I'm an advocate for our council housing stock. It's our ability to ensure all residents have a chance to live in the district in affordable homes. Baron Close, a previous development in the village, which was supported by the parish council and by ward councillors, was an excellent example to be able to give those who do so much for the village, such as the local postman and the local farmer, a place to live and work. Chair, I thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today, and I do hope you will support the officer's recommendation to progress with this scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Horrell. Any questions for Councillor Horrell? No. So thank you for coming along and making your contribution today. Um, now we come to supporters, and I have two names listed. Um, Paul Fraser, the agent, and Debbie Rose. Do I assume that the agent will be speaking and you're there, David, for clarification, should, need, should you be needed? That's correct, yeah. So, um, welcome. And when you're ready, um, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, this proposal is pilot for Winchester City United's new homes department which in response to the council's climate declaration has committed to develop zero carbon homes where possible. For this scheme, this has led to a proposal for a passive house plus development, which over a year will generate an excess of energy and therefore have a negative carbon footprint. Passive house is a tried and tested energy standard that seeks year round thermal comfort, minimal heating in the winter and control of overheating in the summer. Indeed, an overheating modeling has been undertaken here up to 2050 to ensure that the dwellings are future proofed to known climate change data. The scheme is 100% electric, employing photovoltaic panels and a ground source heat pump for hot water. EV charging points are provided to each parking space, and the team are intending to monitor energy use and occupant behaviour to inform future developments. The scheme is proposed as 100% affordable housing, with a mix of dwellings that have been derived directly from the 2019 Housing Needs Assessment by Action Hampshire, which showed the greatest local need was for one and two bed homes. As we've heard, an interrogation of the Hampshire Homes Choice Register also confirmed that 12 local households need one bedroom homes and five need two bedroom homes. This proposal for six flats, which, is, which has parish support, thereby allows potential residents to remain close to their families, friendship groups and local community. Car parking is always an emotive issue on infill developments and this is exacerbated here by removal of an existing garage court. The scheme provides one space to each flat, all to modern space standards, and to offset the loss of the garage court, Winchester City Council are proposing to provide additional parking to the southern end of Southwell Cottages around the existing tourniquet. This is subject to a separate planning application, but the intention, as we have heard again, is that this will be delivered under the same building contract to ensure that they are provide, provide, they're available prior to the completion of the dwellings. In terms of design, the scheme takes its inspiration from the housing materials found in Mitchell Dever, which is in itself a patchwork of styles. The proposals have been designed to echo the adjacent timber dwellings, but here the timber is combined with a traditional Hampshire stock brick for robustness and to help to link it to the rest of the village. 
Roofing materials are proposed to create a clean, crisp appearance that will allow seamless integration of photovoltaic panels, which are too often an insightly and crude afterthought. The frontage is designed to resemble short terrace of houses akin to those opposite, with window size to ensure good daylight inside, but without excessive heat loss, a key consideration for low energy design. To the west, each dwelling has a prime to mini space in the form of a small garden or balcony. The latter will enjoy long views over the adjacent allotments, but have also been carefully designed to ensure um, red local residents can control their overheating and ensure privacy to adjacent neighbours. The scheme is breaking new ground for Winchester City Council in terms of low energy design, therefore respectfully progress that the planning permission is granted today to provide the village with much needed affordable housing, but also the district with an exciting exemplar in net zero carbon development. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you're dead on time. So, Daisy, well done. Um, any questions for the agent or, or Debbie? Dr. Laming. Thank you. Uh, could you just clarify one point, and that's the four area of each of these types of flats, because we've just heard from uh, an objector that they were considered to be small. Yes, of course, the, uh, the floor areas are fully compliant with the nationally described space standards. So they are um, 50 square metres for the one bed and 63 or above square metres for the two bed. Um, one of them is, is slightly larger because it has its own private access point, so it includes the staircase. So, um, But all are fully compliant uh, and, and marginally exceed the, um, the nationally described space standards. And, and could I just ask for clarification on the parking? And I was going to bring it up when we got to highways, but we've heard twice now from Councillor Horrell and from yourself that there's going to be the, the Hampshire highways have recommended eight spaces, I believe, and they're only going to be six with this application. But you've both talked about a later planning application. Um, could you just fill me in with the details of that? Um, yes, so within the uh, submission, uh, within the design access statement, there was um, a proposed layout for um, 13 additional parking spaces to be constructed at the, the top of the road. Um, we had hopes of that, Winchester had hoped that that could be provided via permissive developments, but we now understand that, that requires a separate full application. So. Um, with that information coming a little bit late, so that's why there's a slight delay in getting that through. But we've now been instructed to um, put that application in, so that will be coming through um, in the in the coming weeks for determination. So you you have the land. I can't it, quite understand why this the application um, this application doesn't have the full parking range with it. Um, the um, the parking on sites, do you mean? Um, so the parking on sites is provided as as one for one. Um, the there was a uh, a lot of discussion about the amount of accommodation to be provided on site, and with the the housing need being what it is, the focus was on providing maximum use of the land for accommodation. Um, with the acknowledgement that um, actually on physically on sites there was a um, a slight reduction in the, for the two beds that by the letter of policy should require um, two spaces. One has been provided, but we're seeking to offset that off site with this additional provision um, that is um, uh, at the top of the road. Debbie, I don't know if you have any further points. Yeah, so just to be clear that so the there'll be one parking space for each flat, which um, the planning officer considered was adequate. Um, the additional 13 spaces that are going to come in as a separate planning application are to offset the parking that's lost on the garage site and to provide additional parking in recognition of the objections from the local residents that there was insufficient parking. So there'll be six spaces as part of this scheme and an additional 13 spaces elsewhere on uh, Southbrook Cottages. I see, so it, these extra parking spaces, are they in the locality? Yes, most of the land in Southbrook Cottages is owned by the council and there's a number of grass, quite large grass verges that um, where the parking is proposed to be um, uh, built. So at the top end of, of Southbrook Cottages, there's three grass verges and then there's space there for 13 spaces on the council's land. 
Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Why that's I'm awfully sorry, no. <laughs> um, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Joe. Just based on that line again, the two bedroom flats would require two spaces. Is that correct? I believe two that's, spaces. That's, the, that's the requirement in planning. Would terms. the two parking spaces that are going to be offset in another location be identified as um, a particular parking space for that flat rather than just be one of 13? Um, no, we, we propose to allocate each flat to one space and then the 13 space, the 13 additional spaces will be unallocated parking. So the fact that a two bedroom flat does require two, you're not allocating that space in the 13? Well, I think the point that was made in the planning um, committee report was that this is, um, you know, passive house scheme. We're, we don't wish to encourage people to have two cars. They, it's, 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 um, there is further parking at the bottom of the road. This, the, the plan is that there, there's 13 additional parking spaces. Um, and so each flat has one space and then there's 13 additional spaces elsewhere on, in Southbrook Cottages. Thank you very much. I think that's it for um, questions on that point. So could, um, Verity, did you want to pick anything up there? Um, thank you, Chair. If I just um, speak about the parking. So I consider that six parking spaces is adequate for the development. Um, as Debbie was saying, it is meant to be a carbon neutral, eco friendly um, development scheme. So I wouldn't I don't consider providing over providing car parking would be in line with the aims of having a carbon neutral home. Um, I, I understand that the residents are concerned about the lack of public transport links. Um, so the buses, there's one bus a day. However, we have, you have got Mitchell Dever train station, which is in cycling distance. Um, and I calculate that to be about a 15 minute cycle away from the application site. So taking everything into consideration, I think that six car parking spaces in this instance is acceptable for the site. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Verity. So, we um, will move then on to page 94 and we'll look at the principle of development and design and layout. Any questions there? If not, um, impact on the conservation area, bottom listed building from public rights of way which is at the bottom of page 96 and 97. And then um, impact on residential amenity, page 98. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, with regard to the waste collection, um, is it intended that it will be commercial style bins and not individual bins? Because I noticed it's all at one end of the block. Thank you, Chair. I would presume it's individual bins. Um, I wouldn't be certain that they're not commercial bins, but given the size of each person's bin store, um, it looks like it would be a private bin collection, which it is. Doesn't look enough space to collect nine bins. Do you mean the actual, the actual bin store or the size the, of the bin store? Sorry, if there's six bins, sorry, if there's six flats, three bins per flat, I can't see the size on the diagram as being enough. Yeah, I, I, I will allow the agent to tell us, will there be communal bin? Um, thank you, Chair. No, um, the, the bin stores are distributed, so um, for a number of the plots, they are immediately outside the front door. So the bin store that you saw in those previous plans only accounts for a number of some of the flats that are at that end of the developments around a communal entrance. So that, that isn't the, the only bin store available to, to people. Some have their own personal provision actually outside their front door. 
Thank you, Chair. I didn't realise that because it doesn't actually say it on the Bible. Okay, thank you. So then um, we're at the point of the rest of the report. So page 98, Landscapes and Trees. I think we've done time with the quality. Um, ecology. Um, I just want to list the, I just want to list camp by the other area, nitrates and anything else. So Councillor Pearson. I'm just going to come back to parking, Chairman. The I can understand why these two applications for the parking place and the parking by the flats being separated. And the council is caught between the devil and the blue sea because of our climate emergency. I would suggest, and I'm asking Barrett if this is likely to be so, I know it's a different application. Is it likely that the council will get over the difficulty and make each of those sites for e cars, i.e., charging points allocated to these flats? Thank you, Chair. So each of the parking spaces on site has a, an EV charging point. I'm talking about this separate application. I know why, I presume that's why it's been separate. Chair, uh, Chair, if I may, can I just um, come in in a minute? Um, Councillors, can I just remind you that you need to consider the application that's before you today. An application that may or may not be coming forward may, may or may not be granted planning permission and does not form part of this application that you are considering at this point in time. Don't ask those questions, Councillor Pearson. Yeah, I, when well, it comes in, that's why I hesitate. It will come to the committee because it's like okay. I mean, it's uh, I, I'm fine yeah. with the night trade. So, <clears throat> the only comment I would say with my trade chairman is we seem to concentrate on runoff from land rather than running off from human beings. And I wonder whether the nitrate applicate uh, monies is going to go towards the improvement of a sewage plant. Thank you, chair. I don't have that level of information at the moment. Well, that question, yeah, that's a sort of policy thing which Mrs. Pinnock will be listening to and take forward, I think. Um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, very valid. So, are, are there any more questions or are we moving into debate? Debate. Councillor Pearson. So, I mean, as Councillor Horrell said, I mean, that finding building land for any sort of housing for council is at its premium. And it means that, of course, we're, we're looking at garage sites that are effectively redundant because the original people who use those garages to park their car no longer either use them and therefore use them as domestic storage spaces or in some cases sublet them to someone else who actually isn't part of that particular sub, the original allocation. Uh, it always creates the problem <laughs> and, and this is why and that we caught here between two um, issues, the climate emergency issue, i.e. if we're going to provide parking place, they have to be for e-vehicles, which we've done on the site, and doing a bit of speculating, and this is not an emphasised part of the original site, although personally I think it should be, but it isn't. I think the other parking places that in the other application, and I'm speculating, I know Catherine, I'm thin ice, so listen to what I'm yeah. saying. Um, should be e, e vehicles as well for the exactly the same reasons they are on the okay. other side. Okay, but well, we won't that go down is that not way asking now, for a but... decision about that other application. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, that, that is a crucial issue as far as the actual, a lot of the letters have talked about all the development on the site. Personally, I don't think so. It's no bigger than any other block of terraced units than are already down the road. At uh, least, so your indicative um, pictures would suggest. So I hope that is the case. No, I'm quite, quite happy with this. I'm quite happy with uh, what Verity's conclusions are, although said at a great deal of length by my speeches. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you. I, I liked the inclusion in the previous report of reference to the planning balance, and I think that's an important 
um, aspect of this application. Um, we've heard, and I fully agree with the need for the extra houses and, and uh, what have you, uh, but I am disappointed in the way in which we're, we've sort of considered provision of parking, um, notwithstanding the need to, to try to encourage people to use their cars less. Um, I don't think that if the standards refer to um, eight parking spaces because there are two bedroom flats, that over providing would occur by providing eight. So I think that was a, an unfortunate word. And a 15 minute cycle to the nearest railway station like, um, is fine for young and fit. But we have to consider that it's not just young people um, or fit people that are always going to reside in the houses that are, be, are being provided. So I, I you know, um, I think we have to be mindful of that sort of thing. But I'm on this occasion not going to let that um, lead me to um, uh, vote against the application. Um, but I, um, I don't want to give a signal that just to provide housing, I'm always going to be minded to um, to ignore the need or the impact on on existing streets of um, people in two flats needing to buy to to find two parking spaces. Thank you, and Councillor Reid. Thank you, Jim. I'll try not to go over ground already covered. Um, but we all are aware yeah. that parking uh, parking garages, etc., um, throughout the district have in fact been remodelled into some additional housing, um, basically because the use of them, as Councillor Pearson said, has been lost um, on one means or another to the original uh, reasoning for them. Um, a lot will depend on the public transport facilities in the areas. The fact that, as I already said, 15 minutes away is a railway station, but um, again, already covered, the elderly may find that somewhat difficult to cycle. Um, so I think we've got to bear that in mind. It is unfortunate the additional parking space was not part of this application. It would have made life a great deal easier, I think, for everybody. But in general, um, this is a unit or a collection of units that have been tightly fitted into a parcel of land. Um, I've got no real problems with it um, and I hope it works. It looks like it's going to be a reasonable, if not good, um, use of the land. So I'm, I'm going along with the officer's recommendation to permit. Thank you. Councillor Leamy. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to point out that I've always been in favour of affordable housing in rural communities where it's important for local people to be able to uh, carry on their existence living in the village where they were brought up. And that is a fundamentally important. I also think that this particular uh, development is a way forward for the council and for private developers to look at the way we uh, build houses that are as near carbon neutral as possible. And I think that uh, a lot of private developers ought to take note of the way the council is leading in this. Thank you. Um, if there are no more contributions to debate, then let's move to the vote. This application has been um, recommended for approval. Um, there are a lot of conditions. So we'll start on page 101, and then we go on to, I think, three pages. Yeah, on page 104, and then there's a page of informatives. So could you please show if you are in favour of permitting this application? Uh, that's all, Members Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I am going to try and finish this this morning. The next one, number nine, is on this morning's list. So we'll have to, um, but, oh, sorry, that application is um, permitted. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to carry on with um, item nine as soon as we can get all the um, 
tape on standard time. So if you are leaving the room, please be back really promptly. Sorry. Yes, it was. It's still going to have the knock on effect. Yeah, we spent a long time on the last application. And you're going to spend a long time on this one. This one could be the same. This one will be long. This it will be. This will next yes. be long. But we'll have people turning up at two o'clock. And we'll be going to lunch. Pardon? Then, then we'll be going to lunch. I mean, at two o'clock, we'll be off the lunch. We'll still be at lunch, yeah. What can you do? The next one is quite if you can't come, then it's one hour and ten minutes. Well, if you manage to open half an hour, it's in the planning plan to manage it. It's in the planning plan to manage it. It takes all three sections. We'll take it short and brief. And I'm speaking to myself here. Um, it's a. I mean, it is a fast day. Some items have taken far longer than I'll be doing the case out to be after that. Yeah, I think I'm going to Yeah, sorry. Sounds like I'm going to be going to be there is no suggestion that we have been given an out for the job. I don't think so, Chair. I think we'll we'll give it due process and we'll go through the normal process and, uh, and see what time we get to. Uh, the biggest thing will be making sure you have a sufficient break after this item before you start the afternoon, won't it? And we'll just have to ask people in the afternoon to hold on. Just a few technical details for so and then we'll start. We have the link. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, sorry, Chair, I just don't know what they thought to Matthew about something else, if that's okay. Yeah. After this presentation, the applicants have got a slide, and I don't know if they're going to be showing sure Right, apologies for the delay. We're yeah. having yeah. yeah. trouble yeah. with yeah. getting yeah. presentations yeah. on the screen yeah. today, yeah. but we're yeah. ready to go yeah. now. Yeah. So, yeah. item nine yes. Land off uh, Abbotstone Road, Bogdown, um, 21 slash 01334 slash for FUL. Um, this is for change of use of land from agricultural to class C3 running now. Um, the reshaping of the reservoir to provide for the construction of a floating five bedroom house, part subterranean garage, um, and to include the formation of a new vehicular access from Abbott Stone Road, laying of the driveway and forecourt, engineering works for the purpose of landscaping and the installation of two floating solar islands. The case officer is Verity Murphy, and when you're ready, Verity, we're ready to hear your presentation. Thank you, Chair. The application site is shown in red on this location plan. Here we have a satellite image of the site. So this is the existing uh, disused man-made reservoir. There is a dwelling to the north of the site and the surrounding area is open countryside. This bottom photograph is of the reservoir standing in the southern section of the site. Top photo is looking north, and the bottom photo is taken from Abbotstone Road, so the new dwelling will be located behind this hedgerow here. These are photos that I have added into the presentation, and these show um, the dwelling to the north of the site. So it was a barn and it was converted under a prior notification into a residential dwelling, and you will note the proximity of this to the application site. Of pertinence to this application is a previously refused application, which proposed a very similar scheme to this proposal. So this is the refused application site plan. And here we have the proposed site plan, and you can see that the dwelling has been moved slightly further eastwards on the reservoir. Again, we have um, visuals of the refused scheme and the proposed scheme now, and you will note their similarities. This is the proposed ground floor plan. It's a single storey dwelling. It will have five bedrooms. The living accommodation is centred around an internal courtyard, which will have a plunge pool in the centre. Here we have the proposed roof visualisation. So each of the five connecting pods will have a green roof. Here we have the proposed west and east elevation, and that will be comprised of full height glazing, bronze, aluminium and timber cladding. We have the north and the south elevations as proposed. This section here is the proposed floating bridge, which will connect the house to the mainland. The proposal also involves a subterranean garage, which will be dug into the existing levels of the site. So here we have the proposed garage elevation, the floor plan and the basement floor plan. This is the proposed master plan. So you can see the proposed new dwelling in this corner of the reservoir. There will be habitat creation within the reservoir. Um, these are the two floating solar islands um, and there will be new landscaping uh, within the application sites. This here is the access drive lead leading to the um, subterranean garage there. So here we have the proposed visualizations for the scheme. This is the southeast elevation and entrance, the southwest elevation and outdoor terrace. 
but it's the end of my presentation chair the application is recommended for refusal thank you thank you um and so we come to the public speaking and we just have two supporters listed uh, martin pratt who's the applicant and sky jones um could i just ask are you sharing your three minutes or I don't know who I'm talking to. Uh, I'm, I'm Pat. Uh, Hello. I'm, uh, we, I'm, I'm listening to the villagers um, and uh, watching the uh, You can well, you can either share the three minutes and how you wish, or one person can speak and the other person can be available to answer questions. We're separate, so um, you're separate. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm trying to speak to. Well, this this is something that you'll have to sort out among yourselves. The, the clock will come up. Could we just Matthew? Could we just there's the clock there. When it gets to three, I'm afraid I will have to stop you. Um, and that's it. That's it. that's the contribution. Okay. So well, you well, either well, have you know. You, you do two minutes and the other person does one or well, however you wish. It's not for me to say, but you only have three minutes allocated. Okay. So are we ready to start that? Okay. Yeah. Right, so this is something that we've all been sent anyway. Yeah. Um, so, who's speaking first? <coughs> and you are? Martin Pratt. Mr Pratt, right. Welcome. And when you're ready, the three minutes allocated for this section will start. As pointed out in the case officer's addendum, uh, the strategic planning officer has confirmed that the proposal should be permitted if it is demonstrated to satisfy paragraph 80. And importantly, that this is a matter for officers that are better qualified to comment on design and landscape related matters. We would have great supporting comments of the better qualified consultees, including the design review panel, which confirm that the proposal meets the exceptional design criteria subject to further details required to assure the quality of detailing. You will also be aware that this information has been provided. The design includes an innovative proposal that assures the sustainability of the water level in the reservoir and further measures that help to address the issue of chalk aquifer protection. This is achieved by the use by using the hulls of the house as storage reservoirs that collect excess water in the winter to be used in the drier summer months. Contrary to comments made by the case officer, the design addresses the need for carbon neutral rural transport by generating enough energy from the reservoir to meet the annual energy requirements of the dwelling and provide for 20,000 miles of electric car transport with a well hidden garage with a verdant green roof. These innovative, sustainable design elements add to the outstanding architectural design and together with the specialist consultee comments have been ignored or misunderstood in the officer's report. The proposed scheme will transform a stagnant black plastic lined water body into a sustainable naturalized lake and includes appropriate tree, hedgerow and shrub planting improvements, as well as the creation of a sanctuary for English crayfish which is supported by the local wildlife trust. The proposals will significantly increase, increase biodiversity and enhance the site. I would request that the committee recognize that the specialist consultees support the proposals and that therefore based on best evidence, the design meets the exceptional quality requirements of paragraph 80 and should be approved. I urge you to support this beautiful sustainable building successfully designed by the local architect on my left. Thank you. My name is Guy Jones and I'm a local Olsen resident. Uh, I've lived in the area for 30 years 
and my wife and I do a lot of walking in the area and the reservoir as it currently stands is is a pretty ugly uh, facility and anything that can be done to change and improve that gets my backing. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have to stop you. Um, so, um, Bertie, do you want to add anything from what we've heard in public speaking? No, thank you, Chair. No, thank you. So we move then on to our reports. I have to say that we have received um, quite a considerable number of emails from, from you, and we've read them all, including that one. Um, <clears throat> right. Principle of development on page 125. Any questions? Then there's quite a section on um, the design being exceptional quality and isolated dwelling. Um, and then it goes on next to the next two pages on that about why it's um, exceptional and outstanding. Any questions? Well, we, we could sort of extend those questions because they're not really normal headlines up to page 129 and beyond. I think possibly we'll just say any questions because they're not normal headlines. Okay, so we move then um, on. We have no questions at all on the report. It's all been beautifully described by the case officer. And so we move on to debate. Councillor Pearson. Thank you. I mean, the, the hurdle, as far as this is concerned, is MTR 4, so is it not? Uh, MTR A4, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> and that's it, is in the countryside. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> watching a programme about design, which is regular on television, I can't remember whether Channel 4 or Channel 5, which is about um, houses, um, interesting designs. And I've often said to my wife, and this is relevant, that those planning designs would never get through the city council. And here we've got a classic example of just that. Uh, to say it's not an innovation, frankly, stretches the imagination somewhat. That suggests that uh, somebody, um, an architect or somebody within planning has not got the knowledge, it suggests, and much like it does, it suggests the knowledge to accept actually what innovation is. Um, it, I, I find it a little dis uh, disturbing if, as uh, Mr. Pratt has suggested, there's a lot of expert evidence which has not been included, um, because I can only suggest that a conclusion is reached based at MTR 4 entirely, rather than an interesting design that uses a lake which, and again, natural England, I point a finger out here. I know a local lake in Swampville where it is actually used in order to remove nitrate from the water inflow, and that's the actual lake, um, by the appropriate planting. And judging by the biodiversity information, this that is exactly what is suggested here. Uh, and yet that's been apparently ignored by natural England, which I find a little bit puzzling. Uh, I find it an, an, an interesting and an exciting design, but as I say, the hurdle is MTRA4. Uh, but we've got nothing in planning terms. I'm being perverse of me to say, pray, uh, suggest <laughs> turning down an application because of MTR 4 and here say, OK, let's ignore MTR 4 and pass it. So to a degree, my comments are based on sheer absolute frustration of the inflexibility of a local plan that we ourselves designed. It, everything suggests that this is an energy conservation building. Energy conservation has been involved. Biodiversity has been praised here. Um, nitrate, there is a nitrate solution here. 
which is available, it's, it's not on land, it actually is an on lake, which is already there. And biodiversity people praise the fact that the lake has been extended in order to get this, this uh, design through. So, on court the quandary, um, I like it, but MTRA 4, and I find that incredibly frustrating. Thank you, Councillor. I was just discussing with um, Mrs. Pinnock because in the reasons for refusal on page 132, MTRA 4 does come into it, but equally, um, the uh, national, uh, the MPFF, whatever that stands for, um, paragraph 80E, is uh, says that it's um, it could be passed if it was of exceptional quality, um, outstanding, and um, would enhance its immediate setting. So that is all part of the refusal. In that case, in that case I disagree with the officer's recommendation. Okay, if, if well, that, that, is, that is your, that's up to you. I think it um, is but could you not talk over me, please, yeah. Councillor Pearson? Um, but would one of the officers like to expand on that? Or, Gemma, thank you. I think you're right. I think when we went through the report, and as you say, the principle of development is, is quite lengthy because there are national planning uh, policy uh, policies in the FNPF that, 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 that explain that where you have a presumption normally of uh, resistance or development in the countryside. Paragraph 80 um, of the MPPF sets out a range of criteria A to E where you may well uh, choose to take a different approach because, and then, uh, in this case, it's promoted as paragraph E, that the design is of exceptional quality and that it is, and it's two bullet points, is truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture and would help to raise standard of design more generally in rural areas and would sign significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. And I think what, what the case has sought to do in the report is, is, is bring those points together and, and, and in some quite detail explain why, in our opinion, as local planning authority, we don't necessarily agree with that uh, statement. It's obviously for you here today as the planning committee to, to make that judgment and decide whether you believe that to be the case or not, Chair. I think our reason for refusal sets out why we don't um, believe that to be the case, uh, and that's a recommendation for you to, to make the final decision on today, Chair. Thank you. Any more contributions to debate? Councillor Bentham. Yeah, I found this quite confusing because a lot of it is to do with the languages. Um, some people say it's isolated, some people would say it's not. It's a, sort of almost a matter of judgment and personal opinion. Then it comes down to the idea, is it innovative or is it wonderful design? And well, 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 what's, the, what's the outstanding design? Well, it's just a different way of describing it. I think innovative means it's an outstanding design, whereas the reports seem to say they are quite opposite. Um, I, I like this. I think it's, you know, I agree with Councillor Pearson. It seems a very, very good idea to have, um, be able to see this sort of building in our area. Um, I, I would support it because I think it is innovative, lovely design. I'd love to go and visit it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will not be um, supporting the application. Um, Pre-application advice was given that it was going to be recommended for refusal, um, and which might be why we've been um, sort of bombarded with um, emails. Um, I do actually take issue with the criticism of the case officer, because I think the case officer has put a lot of work into this report. Um, and um, we did refuse a similar application. And, um, I think hang, hang on, Chairman. If you're suggesting I criticise the case um, officer, I did not. No, no, no. Councillor, 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 Pearson, sorry. Councillor Pearson. No, 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 Councillor Pearson, it's not to please. It's no, no, it wasn't please. I value my integrity as being accused of something by. No, 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 you, you weren't, Councillor. Oh, you, you weren't. No, you weren't. I don't, I don't, we'll talk it out offline. 
But I have no idea what you're talking about, Councillor yeah. Pearson, because I haven't accused you of anything. No, no, Councillor, I can help you with that later. Um, uh, Mr. Knight obviously agrees with me. So I'm just looking for the date when we refused um, a very similar one. I think it's 2020. Um, so um, those are the reasons that I shan't be supporting this application. Any further contributions? Chair, before you go on, Bento would just like to add a clarification point following Councillor Bento's um, deputation. Chair, if that's with your permission. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. So, um, when the original, the previous application was submitted, um, the MPPF relevant paragraph was 79E, and that um, allowed applicants to um, either apply under the outstanding route or the innovative route. The innovation side of it has been taken out of the MPPF now, so the um, the design of the dwelling has to be truly outstanding. Thank you, thank you for that explanation. In fact, that's just the point, isn't it? It's it's just a different way of describing something. I, I you know, it's well. Okay, thank you. I can't express what I'm. You made your contribution. Any further contribution? So this um, application has been recommended for refusal for the reasons set out on page 132, 133 with informatives. All those um, supporting the refusal of this application, could you please show? Five members, Chair. And. Um, those against the refusal? Three against. Uh, three, was it three? Three. And abstentions? Yes, one. So that application has been refused. Thank you. That